Right. So this is the first installment of the podcast that I want to do uh, to really showcase very interesting people who've done interesting things in life, uh, particularly around science, technology, uh, engineering, architecture, all of those types of things that would be important in real life in terms of developing worlds, developing societies, and a new way of thinking about what power really means in a tangible way. So um, what I wanted to do is have this first installment and I wanted to have a brother who's a scientist, a brother who is in the trenches uh, doing research on some very interesting topics. I know that we have not formally met uh, flesh to flesh, but I've seen your posts uh, through Facebook throughout the years and particularly I was involved in uh, solar. And so you had some posts around um, uh, thermal, solar mm -hmm. thermal uh, mm -hmm. some years ago. And I found that very interesting. And I thought that the work that you were doing was very cutting edge. And so um, without further ado, what I want to do is just, you know, you introduce yourself, say whatever you want to say about yourself and <laughs> let's just get into a nice conversation amongst brothers who are trying to see what's going on uh, in the world and what's going on with your life and your journey and your path. All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. So a bit about myself. I am um, Professor Ashagan Henry, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Um, my, you know, I would say my overarching goal of all my work at this point is really to mitigate climate change. So, you know, I think that many of our people have varying degrees of um, understanding and knowledge about what climate change even is and what its implications are for us as a people. But, um, you know, my hope is to um, improve our education around that. And I'm specifically trying to work on um, essentially saving what I what I think is essentially saving the human species from extinction. A lot of people think of it as like, okay, the earth's going to get hotter and then we're going to burn up, but it's not, it's not that simple. Um, more so what it is, is that the climate that we have gotten used to, that we have evolved within is changing faster than we are going to be able to evolve and keep up with it. And so it's the destabilization of the stabilized climate that we, you know, um, exist in mm -hmm. that would end up possibly killing us off. So it could be <clears throat> other species that we depend on. It could be plankton, right. it could be trees, it could be different plants that will be affected in some either direct or indirect way of this change in the climate that will then destabilize the ability for modern life to exist in the right. and humans right. exist in, terms, now. in terms of there being some type of break in the chain of the ecosystem. Exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. Before, before we get into, uh, the field of uh, your research and the science. Uh, I just want to kind of unpack what you said. Uh, and at the very beginning, what you said was that what you're involved in is you're trying to save the human race, basically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's quite a lofty ambition. Some people just trying to get money. Some people, <laughs> just, <laughs> some, some people just trying to pay their mortgage. Yeah. Some people yeah. just, yeah. you know, want to make enough money so they can, uh, you know, go to the Super Bowl every year <laughs> or they can to take a vacation, right? So um, you started out off the gate saying that, you know, you decided that you wanted to pursue an opportunity to save the human race. So yeah. let's, let's, let's go back. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. So before you're a mechanical engineer and before you're a professor of mechanical engineering, because, you know, when you become a mechanical engineer, you can work for industry, you can do research, you become a professor, there are many different paths. What I wanna do is I wanna talk about your path to becoming a mechanical engineer. I got right? you. So <clears throat> let's just talk about, you know, where are you from? Where are your parents from? Well, you know, where'd you grow up? How'd you grow up? What, what was going on? So yeah. we can see how you got to where you, where yeah. you are. Yeah. So grew up predominantly in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Both my parents, professors at Florida A&M. Oh, okay. 
Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I think that's why we know some of the same people. Yeah, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I seen that yeah. you know um, uh, David Williamson. You know, yep. yep. Um, I think you know Keenan Rowland too, right? Uh -huh. you know Keenan uh -huh. Rastafari. Uh -huh. Rastafari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> my very, very good brethren, man. I spent okay. a lot of time in Tallahassee. Yeah, so okay. we never cross paths, but I guess yeah. that's it right there. Um, mm -hmm. Tallahassee. So that's the link. You grew up in Tallahassee. Yeah, yeah. I grew up there. I, I um, so. I, we moved, so, so I was actually, it's weird, strangely, I was actually born in Massachusetts, <laughs> Northampton, Massachusetts. Okay. We moved from there to, uh, like, southern slash central Florida, Sarasota, okay. Florida, when I was, like, maybe two or something like that. Okay, and are your, are your parents immigrants, or are they from? Uh, they're both, they, they both black Americans, met at an all-African People's Revolutionary Party meeting. Okay, so, so that's the political framework from which yeah, they're coming yeah, from. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so, so they met. They met at uh, Kwame Torres' organization. Yep. Okay, and that's uh, for some people who don't know. That's Stokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father, even from before that high school years, was he was with the Wilmington Ten, and he was he was politically okay. active from from a youngster. Okay. So so I grew up in a household that was pretty openly stated pan-Africanist and, and uh, nationalist. So okay. I just grew up like that. Um, you know, my, my, I guess many people these days, they take an African name. <laughs> but Ashegun is my birth name. Like my, my parents was on it like that back in the 80s. So they okay. gave me an African name when I was born. Um, there's a whole story behind that too. But suffice it to say, uh, both my parents, professors, um, my mother so, was, so that's a that's a, there's a story behind your name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe my, get into it if you want. Short, yeah, sure. short part, so, long part. So my, I guess I'll do the short short version. My original first name that I picked out was supposed to be Sekou, named okay. after Sekou Toure. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was born, I was about a month late. So I was born. I was 11 pounds, and um, both myself and my mother almost died. Wow. And um, uh, I was in ICU and she, I think she said she talked to a friend who's actually a drummer, um, the two, two famous drummers from New York, uh, um, last name Ince, Gregory Ince and his brother, Walter Ince. Okay. And uh, I forget which one of them she said she was, had, had known, I think it was Walter Ince. And she uh, was asking people, or I guess telling people about the situation and asked him about a name that would mean um, like to overcome something and like a deal. So she she said she uh, prayed to Ogun that if I lived, she would change my name to Ashegun. Okay. So when I lived, that's how my first name became Ashegun. Seku became my middle name. Okay. okay. Um, so so, your, your, so your, your parents were in the Yoruba tradition. So not not actually at that time. Um, yeah. My mom had been exposed. She's from Brooklyn. So she had grown up and seen Santeria growing up. She was always interested in it, but she had not really gotten into it deeply at that time. It wasn't actually till we moved to Tallahassee later that she actually linked up with some people and then actually got more formally into it. And I also got into it along with, with everybody else, with, with, with her and my dad. Okay. So we all got into it around the time that I was about maybe 14. So, um, so we moved to Tallahassee when I was about 10. She took a job as a professor at FAMU. My father was uh, teaching, at high, uh, teaching at a high school in Sarasota. We moved up. He started teaching at a middle school and then teaching adjunct at FAMU. Um, okay. And what were they both teaching? Uh, mom, she taught in adult education. She's called the College of Miss Education. <laughs> okay. And uh, my dad, um, he used to teach a variety of different classes, but his, his background's in political science. So he used to teach, for a while he used to teach like African history, and then he was teaching um, like some professional development, economics course, okay. uh, and political science courses. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so that was kind of by background, I was raised pretty strong with a pretty heavy bent towards, you know, bring home A's, don't bring home no B's. <laughs> um, and interestingly, you know, there was, um, by the time I got to high school, I honestly wasn't all that focused and I actually started bringing home a couple C's. 
And I that's very, that's very, my story. That's my story. That's my I very, story. very distinctly remember my mom gave me one, one pep talk in particular that really stood out for me. And mm. um, I brought on a couple of C's or something. And, and, and she said, um, that's what they want you to do. She was like, that's, that's what the enemy of our people wants you to do. Be mediocre. They want you to be like average and you're not born to be average. And so you, you're giving in to them what it is they want. Right. If you don't go blow it out the water. Like, and, and I remember there was another thing she said, I don't think it was that same conversation, but it was another thing she had said at some point that she was really good for some one-liners. Um, <laughs> and she, uh, she said something to the effect of like, I think she was complaining about her own students at, at FAMU and how they don't want to work. <laughs> And she was like, you know, y'all out here complaining about some academic work. Like y'all ain't doing nothing but using your brain. Like there ain't no backbreaking labor like our ancestors did. This ain't, right. this ain't even hard. Right. And you're complaining, you know? And so that was another piece that really helped to form my perspective, even on the stuff that I'm doing now is really, there is no real upper bound to the level of uh, work that I'm willing to kind of put in to make sure it happens and because for me it doesn't really register as like hard work you know Um, this is this is um, it's a privilege to be able to do this kind of work and 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 think about like trying to do something for our people you know right you think about the kind of stuff that we've done in the past that we've survived so what do you um, think what do you think not to interrupt um yeah but I I don't want to leave that, that that point uh what do you think because what you're saying is that you were getting C's in high school. Mm-hmm. So obviously that was a change. So you were doing very well before high mm-hmm. school. What? I was all right. Okay. I, was, I wasn't really a good student until after that conversation. Fr- after that conversation, I was straight A's. Oh, okay. So grade school, you were getting... Just me, yeah, but and... B's, A's and B's, some C, you know. But yeah, when it, that conversation helped for me make the connection that what I do now will determine my what, what my entire future is. Like, like it's not like real life starts later. Like, it started already. Like, my f- formal, official academic record that will determine what my options are in the rest of my life has already begun. And if you don't buckle down and do it now, you don't get a second chance. You don't get right. to go back and, like, redo high school and be like, no, nah, actually, I'm real smart. Like, take me more seriously. Like, now is the time. All right. So, so is that is that what you said then, or is that what you're saying in retrospect? Um, that's what I said then, and that's why I shifted and was like, there is was a, it an immediate mm, shift. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, that's that's why I say it stood out to me so much because that that one pep talk, I was like, yeah, actually, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, like what is the point? Like why? I was only making C's because I just didn't care. I didn't really understand the connection between what I'm doing in school and what what difference does it make. Because a lot of the subjects, they're not really that tied to what I was thinking about. Like, well, honestly, we didn't have a really super far vision of what I was going to do with my life. Okay. So, so still trying to figure around out. What, 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 what year is this? I'm pretty sure I was like 15, 15, 16. So okay. this must have been ninth, maybe ninth grade, ninth, tenth grade, somewhere around there. Okay. What is this in the 1990s, 1980s? What is this? Uh, I was born in 82. So this is okay. uh, so this is 96, 97, 98. 97, 98. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the world at this time. Mm-hmm. 96, 97, 98. At that time, 98, I had just graduated law school in 98. Mm. So, okay, so around that time, then you were dealing with uh, probably, I'm just trying to figure out what would be going on in the young black kids' world. <laughs> That's so, post, so post March. That. Yeah, yeah that's post Tupac's time. death and uh-huh. and Biggie's death and all of yeah. that, right? Yeah, that's what's that's what's going on. Yeah, in terms yeah. of what's important in your world at the time, right? Well, so this this is the other thing I would say. I, so I was what's important in my world was a bit different than than the normal mainstream. Okay. So the other big thing about growing up in Tallahassee was. Um, I would say other biggest thing that influenced who I became was this, uh, there was a manhood development program in Tallahassee around that time called the Hawk Federation. So it was this program that was kind of like a satellite version of a program developed by Dr. Wave Nobles. Okay. And so 
um, you know, Dr. Denard, Dan Denard. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so he had Arquette started Center. Arquette Center. Yeah. yeah. So I was at the Arquette Center every, every week um, for a manhood development program. And that had a tremendous impact on me because unlike most guys who today of our generation may, you know, be lucky if you got a good dad. <laughs> um, I had a good dad and like 20 other grown men raising me, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and also instilling values and practices and discipline that at that at that point in time would compared to what exists now it was a very much ahead of its time you know what I mean like it was it was very very forward thinking in the way that it was structured and the stuff that we was doing um I, I would venture to say I think that rights experience um in some ways was superior to what things people have managed to reproduce today you know, and, and so I've always wanted to, would have loved, would love to be able to spend some time and actually help recreate some of what existed then. But long story short, that, um, that experience was, was definitely life changing, formative years. And was and, this something that happened every weekend or? Yeah, yeah, every Saturday. Every Saturday. Yep. And for, for the first half of the day, we didn't finish up till about three. 3 p.m. or so. And what was the program? It was uh, other grown men coming in talking to you, or uh, man, it was it was man. So it was uh, it was elaborate. So um, I see you smiling. I'm taking you back, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, so you had a group of grown men in their probably mid twenties, mid to late twenties, college students and grad students who were the trainers, I guess we could call it, mm -hmm. um, in the, in the program, we called them Hersethas. And, um, then a group of anywhere from 10 to 30 young boys on a given Saturday, broken into groups based on what their level of development was. So the first round of, of, of when you first came in, you would spend about a year doing being called what's called a chickpea and then you had to go through the first level of initiation to get to the second level called a herbop then you would go through another year go through initiation become a craftsman and there were seven levels actually ideally in the minimum it was a seven-year program but you weren't guaranteed to go to the next level each time okay it was almost yeah. like it's basically set up based on the mystery school system yes got yes. it got it for those who don't know we're talking about ancient kemet Mm -hmm. uh, the mystery school system. And one of the um, uh, clues to that was when he said Herbach. Mm -hmm. There's a very popular book for those who study those types of things by Schwala de Lubitsch mm -hmm. uh, called Herbach. And he talks about the um, training system, uh, the university training system for manhood development and also professional scientific and um, priesthood development in ancient uh, Kemet or what, you know, ancient Egypt at the time just to give a little context. So yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. They, they, so they had that type of system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I was, I had been after about two years, I, me and this other guy named Jason and then um, Josh, it was about three of us that had made it to the third level, which was craftsmen. Um, you know, what it involved was different at each level, but in short, it involved a combination of learning discipline in a very, uh, what's the word, I want to say practical, hands-on way, in the sense of like the first level was all about learning to control your body. The second level was about learning to control your emotions. And the third level was like about learning to control your mind. And how they would do that is, <clears throat> You might have, it's not like just exercises to be, to be, to just make you strong, but it was exercises. Cause like with young boys, you have to break them out of boyhood because the tendency is to want to um, be nurtured and say, well, I, I don't like you, you ask, you ask a young boy a question and he may just be silent. You might be like, all right, let's put on, they used to, for example, they might put on the news for 10 minutes. We watch the news for 10 minutes, then talk about it for three hours, you know, and then 
in that, and we spent three three hours analyzing that one 10 minute segment of news. Mm -hmm. And they would go around the room and what did you think about this? What did you think about that? And you got a bunch of little boys that's 10, 11 years old. A lot of little boys ain't got nothing to say. They just kind of sit there and shrug mm -hmm. your shoulders, right? And so they would use the physical exercises to force you to engage your mind because I don't have an answer is not a, is not a, a acceptable answer. So then you, you would be, the group would be pushed to do something. So it, so even, so one little boy don't want to do something, we all pay the price, right? <laughs> so you, we, there was a group dynamic where everyone learned and the boys push each other because you don't want somebody to just sit there and then everybody else is, is now in a pickle, you know? I remember yeah. all kind of stuff, man. <laughs> I remember one day, um, one of the brothers, one of the one of the Hersethas said, um, there is a plant with a note on it in my office on FAMU's campus. You have 15 minutes to bring it to me. <laughs> you know, and we had to run, we was running trying to find this office and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. There were different tasks, there were different um things that they would do, but all of it was they had they they would meet in advance of us meeting and they would plan what we were going to do like right. they were the amount of investment of time on their part was just it was incredible and they you weren't know? paid nah okay so this was all free. volunteer and yeah. how old how old were you when you started let's say 11 11 and let's say it lasted three or four years i finished around 14 ish okay. 14 15. okay and and it, and it was just because the program ended you know eventually the attendance waned um, but for those three years, that, that level of discipline stuck with me big time. Yeah. It seems like that was, see what I'm, what I'm trying to do with these types of talks. I don't really mm -hmm. call them interviews. I just call them kind of just vibing conversations, mm -hmm. reasonings within the Rasta, um, linguistics. I am very interested in what were the turning points? what switched the light on for people yeah. who've been successful and productive in life? Cause it wasn't yeah. always like that. You right. know, um, people go in different paths. I mean, it's happened to me in my life and yeah. there are, sometimes we don't, we're not even sure of what that moment was until we're actually pinned down to actually think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it seems to me that that was one of the more seminal oh, times absolutely. in your life in terms of, you know, you'd said your mother's conversation. Now the second thing is, this influence of men, yep. right? Older men, yep. basically giving you an African mental, physical, almost Navy SEAL type of training exactly. in the sense yeah. of saying that, you know, it's not just you, it's about also bettering the group, right? Yep. Um, and that goes on for three years in your life. Yep. And it gives and you, this is after the conversation your mother had with this you? Before, before. actually. This is okay, before. so this is before the conversation. Yeah. So yeah. you went through this, you came out a different person, different boy, but at the same time, the switch for school didn't happen for you in terms exactly. of, yeah. I'm I started going to school, conquer this. In school, yes. A little bit later, sliding in school without this program. And, um, and my mom just said one thing that kind of triggered it. And then like my own will kind of kicked in. Um, okay. So let me ask you a question. There's, other, there's one other important piece, though, that okay. I want to actually highlight. Yeah, please do. This, this is, this, I, a lot of those guys, when I talk to them, who were around back then during that manhood development program, they're a little surprised to hear this. But I, that program is where I became an engineer, actually. Okay. And so, and what it was, was in that program is where we were learning how to think critically. So they would ask us stuff, and then it was like, well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that's, like, I, remember, I was just so many things. I remember, you know, one of the lessons we would do, it's not even just a lesson, it was a principle. And so we were always being questioned about how do you tell the difference between real and unreal? How do you know if something's right or wrong? Mm -hmm. And being programmed with this, this idea that I should question my entire reality and think about these things. Right. I shouldn't take for granted everything that's given to me. Right. That planted a really important foundation. And that's where I started building internally my own framework for like even understanding science and engineering, because it became rooted in this questioning of like, well, how do you know that's right? Right. You know? And then once you learn one thing and you can say, okay, well, 
if that's true, then this must be true. And if somebody says something different, then now I got two things that I have to reconcile because right. these things I know to be true. Right. right. And so that having approach, a rigorous framework of what the definition of true is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, so, yeah. In, in certain scientific fields for the people who are listening, it's called first principles thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, questioning assumptions until you come up with a question with an assumption that really can't be evaluated. So it's like, as they say in hip hop, um, they would say broken down to the very last compound, right? Mm -hmm. The very first compound actually, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so the philosophical approach that that program gave you in terms of looking at the world, mm -hmm. right? Is what then made you seek refuge in science. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was the, because that was how I approached everything now, science and, and math became the subjects that I enjoyed the most because those are the ones Very that interesting. <laughs> Very interesting because they, can, because they can confirm the assumptions. Yes, they were consistent. It right. was like, all right, there's an answer. Right. There's a correct answer. Right. I can prove it. <laughs> right. It's not subjective. It's not subjective. Got it. I, Got I, it. That's very now, interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. Because when you're given um, a room full of people with different opinions, right? It sets, the, it sets the stage for debate, right? And a lot of times debate really is done with language and words and persuasiveness, right? And people who thrive in those environments tend to become lawyers, right? But what was very interesting for you is that that environment led you towards a path of not words, but of numbers. Exactly. Right? Yep. So what it seems to me is that your personality type is, is that you really wanted the final answer. Yep. Right? You weren't too much interested in the art of the words and the art of persuasion. <laughs> um, no, because different That's personality types, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it's, I'm... I'm looking at the personality type because some personality types coming from basically you're looking at the epistemological framework of how things come to be, mm -hmm. right? And some people would take the route of becoming debaters and becoming, you know, going to law advocacy and what have you, but it would be a certain personality who doesn't even find that to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't fully answer that question without asking more questions. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that tends to do that is numbers, right? Yeah. So, so you, you actually, you took that, and it might be based on a level of seriousness in the, that you took that course or mm -hmm. that program, mm -hmm. right? Like that program. So when you wake up on Saturdays, you're looking forward to go there? Yeah, over time, yeah. Initially, it's, it was interesting. It was a very interesting, um, how it started, there was a very interesting day that I remember. Cause like, so, so in the first, let's call it three, three, four weeks were interesting. About let's say 30, 40 boys would show up each morning. They handed us this book uh, called the book of the way with all these little rituals to memorize. And then each week they come back, anybody memorize the, the rituals? We got, we got to do the rituals. And everybody just, they're quiet. Ain't nobody do nothing, you know? And um, and so then, then we would pay the price. They would have us do all these exercises. Yeah, I need to learn the stuff, blah, 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 blah. We come back next week. Anybody learn the rituals? All right, let me stop you right there. Mm -hmm. You say you paid a price. What was the price that was paid? Oh, it was, it was, it was some, it was some exercises till you drop. It was, it was. Physical uh, exercises. Push oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I it. remember one <laughs> that had us do. It's so funny to think back on. I mean, they had us in these little groups of four where, each person is down like you're about to do a push-up. The person at the right angle of you, their feet are on the back of your head. Your feet are on the back of somebody else's head. And they'd be like, push up. And they want to see only four sets of hands on the ground. <laughs> right, and so right. you got to push up in unison right. and push up somebody else's weight. You know, we had to do these push-ups like that. <laughs> so like if somebody falters, then we got to start right. over. Right, <laughs> you right. know, right. those, those kind of exercises and activities, man, they build, they build a lot of... Um, not just character, but like um, they build into you this realization that just 
whatever you want to do, or the, they, they, they help deconstruct indi the significance of individuality. It's like you as an individual don't really matter. All that matters is the group. So yeah, if you can do your pushup, but nobody else can, don't, it don't help us. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to motivate others and get everyone else to do it. Part of that also means checking in with each other throughout the week. And actually, even though we only meet on Saturdays, it's got to become about more than Saturday other than otherwise we all going to be. <laughs> all right. So let me ask you, let me ask you a philosophical question about that. Mm -hmm. As someone, if you are a person X mm -hmm. who can do that push-up, and let's just say other members of your team cannot do the push-up, does it help develop empathy towards the weak or disgust towards the weak? I would say in the moment it manifests as disgust <laughs> because you're feeling the pain at that time. Right. Later during the week, it becomes empathy and it becomes a bit of a fire under your own butt to be on them about about doing it. But here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing. This is where I was going to go with the story. There's something interesting about boys, about how boys learn, which we learn by example. And so after, let's say, three weeks, four, like number of weeks went by every week we come. It's the same response. Did anybody learn the rituals? No, no, no. And one week, there was a young brother named Edward Bright. <laughs> and one week, Edward Bright stood up. He hit the position of righteousness. He said, I, I, I remember, I memorized the rituals. They was like, hit it. And he said, he hit it real hard. He said the whole thing. And everybody was like, and the next week, everybody knew the rituals. You see, it was the, it was the idea None of us wanted to take it seriously. It took one of us and to see their response to one kid taking it seriously and then everybody took it seriously. Mm. It was like, it wasn't cool to take this serious. It's like, mm. man, what is this program, man? <laughs> These guys in here right. messing with us about some, about some rituals and all mm. this. And once you see one boy take it serious and you see that that's actually a good, a cool thing to do, like everybody fell in line, everybody. And so that's a very, very powerful sentiment and experience to to see like man a week ago 30 boys didn't know nothing right and now this week everybody knows it because one was an example one right. took that plunge and said i'm gonna learn it right you know and so for me these kinds of experiences really planted very very deep seeds of like my own thoughts about you know, like, what's the value of my life? Like, it, to me, it's not, it's, it was, it's like meaningless for me to just go make a bunch of money and have my own family and be like, that is, that's not success. Right. It doesn't mean anything. And you, you think know? that came from, I think that probably came from a combination of your parents, um, their political philosophy, right? Um, AAPRP is based on socialism, mm -hmm. socialist, African socialist revolution, the togetherness of people, mm -hmm. anti-capitalist, and also you seeing it in real life at 10 years old where no individual is greater than the group, right? So it was kind of reinforced, mm -hmm. right? So your parents probably planted a seed of that in a rhetorical fashion, and then maybe in other types of instances throughout your life as a child and watching how they might re relate with people in the neighborhood, people in the community, people in their extended family, mm -hmm. um, what have you. I know that uh, I learned about um, togetherness and working for the group uh, early in my life because we always had family members staying with us, mm. right? Um, there were very few times in my life as a child that, you know, an aunt, you know how it is when um, you're an immigrant, because all my family's from Ghana, I was born in Ghana, and uh, my, my father came to the United States to, uh, to work and uh, to do medicine. So we came over maybe two years after him. And then once we were settled in, that was then kind of like the passage house for mm -hmm. other people in our mm -hmm. family to come. And so, you know, I had aunts staying with us and uncles staying with us and always knew that number one, um, if you have a house and you've, and you've done well, 
you got to leave a space open for other people to come through. Right. And that's kind of stuck with me all my life is that, you know, to always look out for others and to, you know, understand it is more than just you. But I don't think that if I think that made such a profound impact in my life, because even like, you know, I've had roommates, I've had, you know, people I've lived with, where there's girlfriends and what have you. And whenever I would have visitors, you know, like you give up the bed for the visitor. You know, you sleep on the floor, the visitor sleeps on the bed. And this is how it was. And so it's almost like, you know, that's a Ghanaian type of cultural framework where the visitor is like a VIP. Even if that visitor is broken, doesn't have a dollar in their pocket, you treat them like a VIP, right? And I didn't realize that that had that type of impact in my life till later on when I was doing those types of things for for visitors. And sometimes I would have girlfriends ask me why, like, well, you know, like, why is this person get this? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know what I mean? Why are you sleeping on the couch and he's this guy right. sleeping in your bed? You know what I mean? And it was hard to explain until, you know, you kind of break down certain things that were kind of imprinted into your life, you know? So I can, I can certainly relate what you're saying. So you decide now that you want to not only be an engineer, but an engineer. Well, I don't know. Did you decide you want to be a scientist or a mathematician so, so or an engineer? It was kind of some some blurry pieces okay. beginning to form. It, had, it wasn't so clear. Um, around this time also was when I was first hearing and learning about what global warming was altogether. So so back at this time, the ozone layer was also a big discussion point, right? right. And so- This um, is high school now. Yeah, this is beginning of high school, eighth, ninth grade. Okay. And so when I learned about global, I actually, I remember I did a school project on, on the, the ozone layer. This is Tallahassee still, right? Yeah, this is all Tallahassee. Okay. Yeah. And um, I remember um, at some point learning what global warming was. And this was around the first time. So at the same time, in parallel with this, one of the brothers who was the, one of the Hersethas, one of the trainers, was an engineering professor at FAMU. Okay. And he and I became close. And so at the same, in parallel with that, also my parents in the summertime started to put me in like engineering camps, like little summer camp things. Okay. And it was the combination of all those things at the same, you know, reinforcing that I started to think of it as like, I think I'm actually kind of interested in this engineering thing. All right. So when you, when your parents put you into these engineering camps, mm -hmm. are you seeing other black children? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. One, one summer in particular was, was a lot of fun. It was very interesting. Um, they, my parents went to Senegal for a trip. I think it was like for fun, for their own interest. My sister was in medical school at Meharry. Actually, I think has she, yeah, I think she started at Meharry. And they took me up to Tennessee State University to, they, they had a, like, they had a bunch of summer engineering programs for black kids. And so they dropped me off up there. I remember I must have been 15 because I remember I could drive with her in the car. I must have had a permit. And I remember learning how to drive on the highway that summer. And um, anyway, I was in these programs. And yeah, they were basically all black. This was, this was, this was around the time Big died because I remember Big died. Like, okay. right, but this, was when, this was when Life After Death came out. Because everybody <laughs> okay. was listen, listening to it every every morning. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's why I'm trying. I'm trying to yeah. um, time what's happening around that time for a young black kid. You know. Yep. Um, I think your experience would probably be different, which you've probably had many conversations with uh, your peers, um, because you're coming from a, a historically black university where your you know your mother's teaching. You're in Tallahassee. Fam, you was a big part of the economy there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then you have um, one of your supervisors in your program, or one of the elders in your program, who's an engineer, is a black man who's mm -hmm. an engineer. Mm -hmm. Whereas many people who end up where you are right now um, didn't really meet other black people who were engineers until they might have gone to university right. and maybe joined Nesby. Exactly. Right. Yep. So but yours, you already were in that. You were already. Yep. Yeah, there's one other piece, of my upbringing that's also very, very important, which is um, I was a drummer that actually preceded the manhood program. 
the musician. Yeah, I'm a musician. So that yeah, was I've seen you. I've seen you making a um, post on Facebook talking about you getting back to making beats. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Over time, it evolved into to beat making, but the the origin, and I still play to this day when I can. Um, but I grew up playing djembe. Okay. And so, and that honestly was also another key key experience because when we were in Sarasota. Um, Sarasota is like a white town, you know, it's a white kind of retirement town. Mm -hmm. I'm in this family. My parents talk about Africa. I see some pictures on the wall, but that was about the extent of its realness to me. <laughs> and when we moved to Tallahassee, my mom took me to an African dance class with her. She was taking the class. Sister teaching was a sister named Mia Love. And that was, and I heard the music and I saw the dance and that was for the first time Africa came to life for me. Like it was, it was just an idea before, but now it was like African culture is a real thing right. and I could hear it and I could feel it. Right. And definitely something happened to me that day. And how old were you? 10. Okay. And that day, definitely I would say that day my life changed for sure. Um, prior to that, I remember listening to music and kind of enjoying some songs. But from that moment, I became like, like music became like my passion. Like I love, I, whatever I experienced in that day, it turned on something within me mm -hmm. where I just had to do it. I had, I wanted to be, like, I just wanted to drum all the time. Okay. <laughs> you know, I went home, my, 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 my ask for a Kwanzaa gift was I wanted a drum. <laughs> you know, once I got a drum, I was trying to learn how to carve drums, how to put them together. I was, mm -hmm. all I wanted to do was play drums and, and, and be in that, immersed in that. Okay. That's how that's how I know David. That's how a lot of people in Tallahassee knew me as, as a drummer. Really? Yeah, yeah. Everybody oh, knew me as a drummer. I was the little kid drummer. <laughs> okay, so you 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 drummed with uh, different groups? Oh yeah. Well, there was one. There weren't a whole lot of groups at that time. Um, there was one main group started by a brother named or with with a brother named uh, Eric Bond. He was like my first drum teacher. He also was a huge influence on me as well because his his overarching, I would say, demeanor or approach to life is one of like not only should we we plan and have and have things well thought out, but he's the type of person that would look at like, um, here's what we have and let's just go ahead and do it. Like he's a he's like a let's do it kind of cat. And mm -hmm. so one great example of this is he he tells a story because he's essentially he is largely responsible for all the drumming you see in Tallahassee now, okay. and, and even maybe even other parts of Florida as well. And it was largely because he had come from another city, I believe it was Cincinnati. He had learned how to play. He was a drummer, but, and he had drums, but they were broken. So now that he's trying to figure out how to fix these broken drums and he was trying to work with his teacher to send him back and go back and learn and all this stuff. And it was like winter time and they didn't have time. They didn't want to, you know, deal with it. And so he says he was riding around one day and he was like, Tallahassee got trees. Tallahassee got goats. We could, we, let's try to figure it out. You know, he was the, one of those kind of people that he took the step of, I'm going to try to make my own drum then you know right with the trees the resources the, and the here. trees and the, the goat skin yeah he was like i'm gonna try and by him trying that really you know everything exploded after that so i was kind of a product of that mentality you know mm -hmm. that that also played a very big role in who i came to be you know he him and another brother eventually moved to tallahassee a little bit later named osha b craig he's a good brother of mine you know i also picked up a lot of personality traits from them like kind of a hustle mentality like we don't we don't sit around and wait <laughs> we we get up and go do things and uh we we're very very resourceful if if there's a problem to be solved we look at what we have we organize we and we mobilize and we we do we don't sit back and complain we're not complainers and so i picked up a lot of that from them you know from watching them so that's that's the key piece i was trying to raise is that my world was kind of was pretty different than my peers because all of my closest friends were like 10 years older than me 
So I'm like this little kid, 10 years old, and my best, my closest friends are 20, 25, mm. 30. You know, these are grown men that are like, you know, I, I wasn't super close with other kids my age. Interesting. So that kind of drew me to, I think, mature a lot faster. Um, Cause I was, that was where I was like, instead of, I mean, I did play, hang out and play basketball after school a little bit, but mm. after that I would go play. I was making my own money. You know, I was getting paid to be a drummer. I had a bank account. I had a few thousand dollars to my name as like at the age 16 and stuff. So, you know, these kinds of things put me in a different position, you know, with respect to my peers where I was thinking further. Like I remember getting my first mutual fund at like 16 or something. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I was trying to learn how to invest and stuff like that. And right. I was, I was, uh, I was just thinking on a different level than most of my peers, you know, because of what I've been exposed to. Okay. So, you know, a lot of times this could just be a, a nature thing or a nurture thing, but you know, a lot of times when a child gets into the arts and it's something that has a profound influence in their life, it hits them pretty hard and they get into the arts. You know, I'm friends with a lot of artists. I, also, I'm an artist, and I mean, I don't do much of it these days, but I was, I was an artist as well. Um, what you find is that a lot of artists, as they say, are right-brained. Um, what do you think made you, because you're saying at 10 years old, that music hit. That music hit you, and it hit you hard, and you were doing it on a serious level to the point where you were getting paid to do it. You were professional. Um, what makes you also then say, hmm, I mean, you explained the uh, class you went to on Saturdays, the mentorships that you went to on Saturdays, but what makes a young man, hip hop is hitting hard, uh, being an artist is a very attractive thing as a child, right? Um, Those are your superheroes at the time, artists, you know, um, what makes you choose that you're going to do both arts and science? Yeah. So, so this is a, this is a really good question. And I, I have very vivid memories of going through this reasoning process. So, so what I was getting from the manhood program was, was in the driver's seat. So yeah, I was a drummer. I enjoyed it, but I was also watching and I see, the guys that are my teachers, the people who I'm playing with, and we all love it, but it it can't, you know, I'm looking at it, it's like, you can't, you can't make a a living doing this. You know, the bottom You saw, you saw their struggles. Yeah. And I was like, this isn't a viable career path. You know, just- What age were you when you saw that? This was like, this is 15, 15, Mm -hmm. 16, where I'm like, I remember making the choice because I because I thought about I was like I could go deep off the deep end on the drumming thing like I could try to just be one of these people that will um, immerse themselves in the culture and be a cultural preservationist mm-hmm. and I think what I realized at the same time I learned at some point in school about the the concept of opportunity cost and I thought about it and I was like there's there's plenty of other guys to go do that i need to do the thing that only i can do Mm. which is be this be an engineer be something else like i remember also around this time it's funny you mentioned uh stokely um you know he used to come john henry clark used to come to tallahassee and give give talks and i used to i used to be there i used to be a little kid in the audience i was around at those times Mm. and um what became clear to me is that we are not in short supply of people to analyze what's wrong with us, what has happened to us and to tell us what it is we should be doing. We have, we have plenty of great orators who can speak, who can tell us, who can tell the world and tell our people all these things that, that we don't need another one of those. I need to do something different you know and that's what started to spark me thinking about well, what is it that i can do and what is the what what's going to be more meaningful because it's like a lot of talk it's a lot of talk (laughs) 
you know, and, and the one consistent element in all this is we need to own our own stuff. We need to own our own resources. Mm -hmm. and, but it's like, but it always starts with those two words. We need, we need, <laughs> we need, <laughs> yeah. we need. exactly. Yeah. And then, I'm, but then I'm, but because now I've been trained to analyze and think critically, I'm like, but these people saying it, that's not what they're doing. They're just right. telling us. To, so we don't need more people saying we need to figure out how to do that. Right. And that's what got me at that age, like thinking, well, what can I do? Like, how are we going to get these resources? They ain't going to give it to us. So then what does right. that look like? And I started going through okay. the whole process. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So then that's why then being a drummer almost kind of soured. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it was But like, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If for some reason, I don't know, George Clinton came down, saw you drumming, and they were going to give you a record contract to make albums and you could be a millionaire being a drummer. What do you think would have happened to you? Um, Based on all those lectures that you heard yeah, and, yeah, and all yeah, of that remember. going around in your mind, but now actually becoming a viable man who can take care of a family and be wealthy being an artist. I, I would like to think that at that time, I would have I would have thought of trying to figure a way of doing both because I would have saw that opportunity to make that much money in that short of a time frame as something I wouldn't want to give up. Mm -hmm. But it would have never turned into me placing all my that would have never become the full story. That would have merely just been an because I had worked out in my mind that um, the flaw with being a musician or artist is that your income hinges on other people's perception. If they don't like what you made this week, then then that's the end of it for you. Like you hot until you're not. Right. And I can't raise no family on hot until I'm not. Right. <laughs> so for me, I had done that, that logic. Like that wasn't gonna be good enough. Like no matter how you cut it. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that those older men being in your life who are artists and drummers, mm -hmm. I think that that informed a lot of that. Right. Oh, yeah, because I watched them struggle, man. Right. And they got kids they trying to support. And I'm lo I'm looking at them angry because they're not getting paid as much as they feel like they should be for right. playing a drum. And I'm like, this is a this is not I don't I don't want to be in the business of trying to convince somebody about my worth or the worth right. the value of what we're doing. That's that's not right. this isn't going anywhere. Right. You know, there's got to be a better way. OK, so when are you settled in with you're going to be a scientist so that was uh so the brother who was the her second was a professor his name is makola makola abdullah in the midst of we, let's say i must have been 16. and was he a professor of uh civil engineering civil engineering uh, he's, oh, got yeah, a, for the he's got a he's got a very interesting story. He's, he's, okay. to, he's, he's people, president of Virginia State University now. Oh, I would love to have him on the podcast if you can, yeah if, yeah you yeah know, connect us. I would love to talk to him. Um, yeah. For people who are listening, civil engineers, those are the ones responsible for your bridges and your roads and those types of municipal projects. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so he um, he was interested in the pyramids. So he hired me. He gave me a summer job to work with his grad students and research the pyramids. He was curious how they were built. And he wanted a group of people. He had like some side money. He was going to pay some students to go look into it. So I got to do that for a summer. That, that blew my mind, man. I was really? like, oh, so into it. So, so what, what did you find out? Oh, man. So we learned, we learned a lot. In short, we could not explain how they were built. But we did find lots of interesting facts to marvel at. Right, right. Um, but you didn't understand exactly how that could have been pulled off. No. So even today, if you were to take a guess, I mean, there are different competing ideas. I mean, you know, the, the Japanese and the Germans tried to recreate the pyramids and their machines broke, right? This is um, king. Yeah. This is king. So, but, I mean, you know, there's the theory of the aliens building it and we, yeah. you know, we don't accept yeah, yeah. that. We don't accept that. But based on what you know from understanding engineering from a mechanical point of view, um, let's talk about that for a minute. Because yeah. I'm, I'm into this type of, I'm into Yeah, this. yeah, yeah, I'm with you, man. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm happy we're having this conversation, you know. Um, 
from where you're coming from, from this uh, academy training, and also from your African cultural perspective, knowing um, that our story has not been told and is not told in the academy. And the academy is, you know, the, the institutions, the people listening, the institutions that, you know, confer PhDs on people. Um, so in your best estimation, combining both worlds, what would be your best guess as to how, let's just say, um, when we're talking about the pyramids, we're talking about the three, the three mm -hmm. pyramids. The, the huge pyramids right. in Giza, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about those. So, I mean, we could talk about the Great Pyramid. So for people, why don't we just lay, you know, because there are going to yeah. be children watching this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's going to be other, you know, people watching this from different walks of life. And that's why I try to give a little context, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll just start out with this. And then you can come in. You'll probably be able to throw in much more than, than me. But when we talk about the Great Pyramid, I understand that each block uh, weighs between uh, 4,000 and 8,000 pounds. And it is full of 4,000, 8,000 pound blocks that number 21 million blocks, right? And then there are certain types of astro astronomical al alignments as well and um, Fibonacci numbers and all of that. So um, that's, you know, is lined up with certain stars and what have you. So yep. um, you just go on with it now. <laughs> <laughs> you just go on with it now. So, so I mean, in my, um, my perspective now is essentially no different than it was when I finished that summer, which is we actually have no explanation for how that was done. We, there, there appears to have been some knowledge and understanding that we don't currently have okay. that existed at that time. Before we get into that, mm -hmm. um, for those who are listening, um, you know, educationally, is there more you would like to add about the wonders of the pyramids? Oh yeah, man, I could go. Yeah, so so. <clears throat> like, what makes some, them so special? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there had been some analysis at that time that. Um, some of the structures in that area, not just the pyramids, but, but even if you just think about the pyramids, you know, um, some of those blocks are so heavy that <clears throat> although there exists cranes today that technically could pick up the weight, the way a crane operates, it has to have what's called a counterweight. You know, if you pick up something heavy on this side, it's going to tip over. So you got to put a bunch of weight on the back to keep it upright. If you account for the counterweights, you can't actually do the construction of the pyramids because the cranes would sink into the sand. <laughs> like it's too heavy. And so it's not clear how any of that was done. It's clear where the blocks were, came, were cut from. They know, they know where the quarry was and it's far. Mm -hmm. It's not like right next to it. They have now unearthed many, much of the area right outside the pyramids and they believe their beliefs and, and that, that there's essentially a, uh, a whole city of of dead bodies like people are buried there right outside and they believe that those are the people that may have built it um the ratio of the height to the circumference is was is specified is, is done in such a way that it mimics the ratio of the earth's radius to circumference mm -hmm. the the height to the base rather i think i think that's what it is yeah, yeah the, the height to the base the 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 level of precision is what is is what is mind boggling. Right. The precision is so. Nicole, I remember when we were doing it that summer, we had looked at, um, you know, so when the biggest pyramid, there's a there is a passage that goes actually underground, goes down at an angle, goes uh, it's up on the pyramid a bit, then it goes down at an angle, goes down into the ground, and. Um, the height variance between the floor and the ceiling in that passage is less than a quarter of an inch over an entire football field. And I remember McCullough being 
mind blown by that because he was like, you all standing in my office right now, there's more of a, more than a quarter inch variance between that corner and this corner of this, of this room. <laughs> to be able to put something together that precise. Right, in construction, that, they would use like a level. Yeah. Right? They would use a level in, in construction. But right. now this is at an angle. Right. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's at an angle. Yeah. yeah that's a little is, bit different. Yeah, this is yeah, like. a little bit different. It's not straight. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a straight level, it's an angled level. It's an angled level and it's like perfect. So the, the level of precision and the perfection with which I, I don't know that we have tools or the ability to recreate it at that level. It's just, it's too perfect. There are so many aspects of it that, you know, for example, the star shaft, this is where I learned about the processional cycle. I mean, all this stuff was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's awesome. So you have, um, there are inside what they call the king's chamber. We don't really know what the building is. We don't even know what it is, quite honestly. Right, we don't know different before. theories, but there's no. There was never any mummies found inside of them. So all this talk about all oh, they're like these these dedic they're dedicated to these kings and whatnot. Their bodies mm -hmm. weren't in there. There's something that kind of looks like a bathtub. They like to call that a sarcophagus, like where the body must have been. But there's no body in there. There's just a there's just some mm -hmm. constructed thing in there. Who knows what it is. Then on the walls, they have these like six inch by six inch or so uh, holes, passageways, and they go out and they turn and they go up at an angle and they point at certain stars. And they, but they're only aligned with the stars, like it's like, like four different stars at a particular point in the procession, like at the peak of the processional cycle. So this, what this, in, what this shows you is that, and, and then like when you back calculate when people think they were made. Right, and that's a whole, that's a whole nother story. That's too. a whole nother story. They would have been somewhere in the middle of a processional cycle. So it tells you that they must have known that the processional cycle existed. Right. You know? right. Because right. they, you know, presumably they made these things and aligned them for a time period that they didn't even exist in at the time that they were making it. Like right. that's not the alignment at the time. Right. So they, they projected. So, you know, let me just say for the, the processional cycle is just so deep, you know, because so the earth is spinning, it's at an angle um, with respect to the plane of, of orbit around the sun. So it's angled slightly, but then that angle is wobbling very, very slowly. And it takes about, 20, I think it's 28,000 years to cycle. Mm -hmm. And so they built into this thing knowledge that they had a knowledge of a 28,000 year cycle. Um, yeah. And so all of that stuff was just mind blowing. Then, like I kept following up on it because it just was so it was so mind blowing. Then they stuck robots in these little holes and these they called star shafts. They put robots in there and they sent little drones in there to try to figure out what's in there. They went. When you say in there, they when you say they. Um, some scientists, some some modern some, day scientists. Yeah, regular regular modern day scientists right. were curious what's in there. They made some little robots that could drive mm -hmm. and go in there. And they go in there and even more mind blowing. They go up halfway and there's a door with, with handles on it made out of metal. And then next to the door is a pipe and the pipe's got threads on it. <laughs> and, they had to, and they had to send robots because a human being couldn't fit. Yeah, the, it's, so, it's too small. You can't, it's, right. we're talking too far to put your hand in there. And you know, they, got, they made a little robot specifically designed to go in and drive in there. And then they were testing what's behind the door. And it's like, it, 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 I remember they even did some um, acoustic tests and they found that there are other rooms in there. They don't know how to get to them, <laughs> mm -hmm. but there are other cavities inside the pyramid and they have no idea how to get there. And there's like cavities they found that are filled with sand, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So what this thing even is, how it was constructed, what its purpose was, like none of that is clear. None of it, it's just not, we don't know what any of that means. And so I'm, the greatest comfort I have found is just that our ancestors knew a whole lot that we don't. And I don't know what they were, I don't know what that thing was for or what it's uh -huh. about or what it is, but whatever, the one thing that is clear is that they knew a bunch of stuff we don't. Right. And, for sure. Um, so I've, I've um, looked at uh, some of the work of, um, man, I forget this guy's name, this guy named Randall Carlson. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, there's a guy, I forget, there is a geologist 
who looked at some of the weather, the, um, the weathering of the Sphinx and all yeah. that, and was able to yeah. say basically that those weather patterns only existed thousands yeah. of years before yeah. the dates that they're actually claiming yeah. that yeah. these structures were made way before. Yeah. Um, so they have to actually set the times back and the yeah. dates back. Yeah. But what is interesting um, in all of their analyses is they talk about cataclysmic events mm -hmm. happening in the world because the question is, is that, well, if our ancestors knew all of that knowledge, why, what happened in terms of passing down that knowledge? Because pyramids are a multi-generational project. Um, these, <laughs> these types of, well, I think that there was some evidence showing that it was made, it was made over a couple of generations in terms of some of the work records that they were talking about right. that were passed from different kings, from different okay. pharaohs. Okay. Um, so it wasn't just like a one feral lifetime project. Mm -hmm. So what's clear is, is that there's been a discon discontinuity of intellectual heritage, mm. right? In terms of mathematics, engineering. I mean, I've looked at some of the um, papyri that existed that they've renamed after Europeans, such as the Edwin Smith papyrus. The, um, the Ebers papyrus. Um, there's also what they call the Moscow and the Rhind papyrus. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the Moscow papyrus where they're showing geometrical proofs, mathematical calculations, and the mm -hmm. steps in solving those equations are actually what in mathematics they call the most elegant mm -hmm. steps in solving the, you know, the most efficient ways to solve the equation. And there are all these different examples. And anyone who's interested, who's listening to this, they can um, get Shake onto Diop's book, mm. which is um, a book called Civilization or Barbarism. And there's a whole sections that he deals with the mathematical formulas and different papyruses. And it just shows that intellectually, um, they're further ahead in many ways than we are now. So the question, that's begged to be asked is what happened, mm. right? And some of the explications have been that there were certain what you call extinction events mm. that have happened, or simply um, <clears throat> there's natural ext extinction events and then there's man-made extinction events. When you look at, you know, books like The Destruction of Black Civilization, what's so good about this conversation we're having is, is that, um, you've read the same books I've read, you, you know, because you were in that type of culture. I was in, yeah. Um, yeah, you were in that culture where a lot of times I might talk to someone who's a scientist, but doesn't right. have some of the African cultural treatises right. or texts right. that are kind of the underpinning, underpinning of like the Pan-Africanist movement and, and, and what have you. So, you know, Destruction of Black Civilization, Shaikhan, the Diop, those aren't new names to you. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that can happen is wars. Right. So, for instance, there are stories of Alexander the Macedonian, which they call Ac Eric Alexander the Great, which they name, you know, the city after him, Alexandria, and the university after him. But, you know, he was responsible for burning libraries. Mm -hmm. Right. And I always tell a story of like, um, I remember I was living in Miami and um, a friend of mine had a, another friend who was a crack addict. And his crack addict friend went into his house to steal things from his house. So he like lived very minimalistically and all he had basically was a computer in his house. And so he comes back and the screen is gone. He didn't even have a TV, but the screen is gone. Um, he didn't have anything really in his house, right? Just his clothes, just a regular, you know, bachelor light lifestyle, right? his clothes and a computer. So the guy was a graphic designer. Mm. And um, he knew that it was this guy who took it. So he went over to this guy's house, mm -hmm. you know, and found his computer screen. The crazy thing was, was that the computer itself was left in his mm -hmm. house. It was not taken, which is really the most important part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And the reality was that his friend who was the crack addict or his acquaintance who was the crack addict didn't know 
that the real value of the computer was in the box and not the screen, mm -hmm. right? So that also takes me back to invading forces of Europeans and Persians and Syrians and what have you. And, you know, you've got hieroglyphic texts that haven't been deciphered until, you know, Champollion uh, with the Rosetta Stone. And that's in the, what, 17, 1800s. But before that, they're looking at, you know, pictures of, you know, different physical forms and they can't make sense of it and they're burning it, right? So with that, a lot of intellectual heritage could be lost because they're burning things they don't even know the value of because of war, right? That the world has lost so much in terms of intellectual. I mean, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen some, like I've seen some of the Stella with like helicopters, it looks like. Have you seen it on Hatshepsut's tomb? Mm -hmm. I've seen the, the pictures of what appear to be like a kind of like an airplane. But not an yeah, airplane. like airplane, hel like mm -hmm. really interesting, very mm -hmm. interesting. So um, I, I honestly don't put anything past what could have existed at that time. You know, there's all all kinds of assumptions I hear that the Egyptologists make, and they're like, "Well, mm. well, they didn't they didn't have electricity." So they, I'm like, "Who says they didn't have it?" Right, How right. And know? actually, one of the theories was that the pyramids were actually power plants. Who knows, man? Yeah, I, 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 all, all theories other than aliens. Right. I, I mean, the most theories are on the table in my opinion. Right, right, you know? right. There's nothing proven because if that's yeah. what it is, then we the only way to prove it is if we can generate power from it. Right, right. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of playful thoughts about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But um, basically, as a so old were you when you started doing your investigation of the pyramids? That, that was a summer that project. Was, that was 16 because I remember I was okay. first just started driving. Okay. And so <clears throat> that keyed me into like, I think I like this engineering thing. What really made me want to be an engineer though was cal taking calculus senior year in high school. That was where I was like, okay, and I, I distinctly remember when it was too, actually. Um, I had actually a very good teacher. His name was Coach Mead. And he was a high school teacher, but he apparently was an engineer. And so I'll never forget, man. Um, it was me, <clears throat> this other guy named Omari, who was like my best friend, another guy named Shola. Was three brothers in a class, the rest of the class was white. And Coach Me took about a week. He was he was a very good teacher. He took about a week to explain to us what the meaning and value and purpose of what he was going to teach us next week was going to be. Like he he would he would give a tremendous amount of time to the context. And like he hyped, he would hype something up so hyped. We was on the edge of our seat, like, man, just teach it to us already, man. I want to yeah. know what he... Yeah. So he was like, next week, we're going to learn this thing called the derivative. Right. <laughs> and he's like, when you learn what the derivative is, you will be within the less than 0.1% of the human population that actually even knows what this is. Yeah. And you need to know what this is if you want to put a man on the moon. Like, this is the, this is a key thing that you got to know. Yeah. You know, he would hype it up. And it was like, yeah. if you, you know... And I remember he, so he teaches it to us. Then the, the very first example problem he does was like some companies selling hamburgers and they've been recording the data for how many hamburgers they sell uh, when they sell the hamburgers at a different price. So he makes this plot, right? And he says, and he asks this very basic question. So he says, what is the best price to sell your hamburger so you make the most profit? And I was like, and then he says, all you got to do is take the derivative and set it to zero. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, what? like, 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 like there's an exact, like, like the idea that there's an exact way to calculate, this is the optimum price. Right. There ain't no question about it. Ain't no argument. Like right. you can figure out the exact price, like right. what's right. optimal. I got to Based on what you just said, I got to go back and study these derivatives. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. what's so crazy about what you're saying though? is that um, I was always very good at math. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually went to college to become a mathematician. Mm. But when I got to college, um, I was very discouraged because math stopped being math and it started becoming word problems. Mm. And there was no context. I couldn't grasp 
turning these words mm -hmm. that they were trying to pose into formulas. Well, I was always good with formulas, mm -hmm. but when it became word problems and then it goes into, you know, physics basically is word problems that you have to decipher into equations. Mm -hmm. And that really discouraged me. And later on in life, I said, you know what? I want to relearn physics. Mm -hmm. So my first step was actually going deep in studying Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. not just his formula, but him as a person. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this guy basically invented calculus mm. on his uh, summer break, because mm. there was a break, because there was a bubonic plague, and so they couldn't go to the university anymore. So he had a summer break. He had nothing to do. So, <laughs> so this dude invents calculus. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. This is, that, that's just crazy. So it's funny that you bring up whole derivatives, because literally I have two of his um, uh, two books on him that I read from time to time that I haven't, you know, gotten through some of his treaties, but I, I mean, I found him to be a very fascinating person, man. Mm -hmm. And um, just the fact that you brought that up about derivatives and the price and me, you know, doing different businesses, I'm going to start looking into that a little bit more seriously. Man, I, it was um, that lesson is deep, man. It's like one single lesson. I can, I can point to that and say like that, when that turned on the that, light for you. Oh man, I was like, all of a sudden, math became cool. Yeah, you Very see, the cool. teachers you have matter, man. The teachers Absolutely. you have matter. Those who turn on that light bulb, they matter, man. Because mm -hmm. one of my biggest regrets is that I really wish I'd have had a physics teacher mm -hmm. who somehow I could understand or could make me understand what the task was at hand. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. to, to be able to interpret what's being said to what needs to be translated yes yes. you know um and teaching is a skill not everyone can teach mm -hmm. you know man i i wish i had that i wish i had that professor you had man my life would have definitely yes. been more yeah. physics oriented yeah. that was the thing man and so so i thought it was cool and the other two brothers in the class thought it was cool this is high school high school this is a senior year of high school so me, Omari, and Shola, we used to, we used to, we, I don't even think we really studied, man. Like we were just so into the subject. Now it was just, we, there was like this knowledge and this appreciation that like, we invented all this math mm -hmm. shit. Like, 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 of course we're going to understand it better than all these white folks in the room. Like, like, like we all, and we used to come in there and we used to kill the curve. We, we lit all three of us used to bust hundreds on each test. And there was no curve, and they used to hate us. To, <laughs> and we, oh, it was, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it went on so bad. It was so funny because we used to start, like, we used to get hype. We would go outside the little, it was like a little pavilion. And we used to huddle up before an exam mm -hmm. and get hype and then run in there and kill it and be the first ones done and run out. And we had hundreds. <laughs> yeah, man. And I think that that, you know, um, that perspective of we invented math, mm -hmm. right? does a lot for a young black kid because I didn't get on that type of energy until my college days, mm -hmm. you know, until I understood because I was quite ignorant. I remember sophomore year of high school, you know, I, I was one of the popular kids in school. Mm -hmm. So we used to sit around just talking trash all the time with each other. That was high school. We just get together and just, you know, crack on each other. Yeah, crack on each other <laughs> talking trash. And, talking trash and someone's talking trash to me and someone says to me um they're talking about egypt you know they say egypt was in africa and here i am born in africa and i challenged the person i was like egypt ain't in no africa because mm. all the time in my mind all i've seen about egypt was europeans right mm -hmm. and i lost a bet you know dude pulled out a map showed me Egypt was on the continent of Africa. And that, I think that probably, that humbling experience probably changed my life where I started reading, was interested in reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know, and then everything just went on from there until I get into like the serious texts and start getting into Chekhan to Diop when I'm in, you know, university in those later years where I do have a chip on my shoulder understanding the African contribution to math, science, and the African origin of all of these things. But 
you know, you already had that from the politicization of your childhood, from your parents and the community that you were in. And that's why those types of things are so important. I hope people listening to this, um, I think whether you know it or not, bro, I mean, this conversation we're having and what you're saying is going to really inspire a lot of people who are watching this thing, because really we're talking about the ingredients that are necessary, indispensable for someone to become where you, you know, to, to go where you, where you, where you're at. And I think people see when they'll say, oh, he's a scientist, but they don't know the story. Right, 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 right. They don't know all of these things, these monumental things that happen in a person's life yeah. where a person is actually in a community where he's encouraged to be a science nerd mm -hmm. because his friends are science nerds and he's not mm -hmm. ostracized. He, this, is, this is what's going on. This is what we like. You got black professors and you got black folks around you encouraging this and yep. you know the idea that you would be ostracized for being you know a nerd is not even something that's in your community right 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 and then also that you have the freedom to explore being an artist mm -hmm. and because on the other side you know i grew up with Ghanaians and nigerian kids who being an artist was not an option <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> exactly. You know, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And if you're a lawyer, okay, I guess we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So getting back to senior year, you're on fire. Mm -hmm. You're on fire when it's coming to calculus. Yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. And so now it's time for you to decide university. Yeah, and honestly, it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> at this point in time, my world was so small. I didn't even. I it, no. Uh, I never even applied anywhere else. I only applied to family. I mean, I, I, it never occurred to me that I could go anywhere else like that. I would. I, I wanted to go to fam. I grew up there. Mm -hmm. It was just a foregone conclusion. Yeah, I'm going to fam for undergrad. And cool. I hadn't even thought about grad school at that time. So. And and at this time, are you matriculating into FAMU for the purpose of being an engineer? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so what, what made you decide? Because just because you're good at calculus doesn't mean you're going to be an engineer. So it was, it was the connection of those the summer pyramids. programs from before. Okay. The pyramids. No, no, no. Summer programs for where they teach you like what engineering even is, like at Tennessee right. State. Okay. And then like when I actually could see like calculus was the first time that math actually became meaningful to me. Like prior to that, it was just something to do like, it, you know, but once somebody put it in terms of like, I can make money with math, like I can make this, it, it actually changes my decisions. Right. Then I was like the whole world of like, I, the fascination with what else can I do with it opened right. up. So senior year, I finish up, then another huge thing happened. So between senior year and starting college, so, so another thing happened, because I knew I was going, I knew I wanted to go to FAM. I knew where I wanted to stay, got my housing application in like a year early, so I'll be first come first serve, because I knew the system, <laughs> you know, and I made sure I passed just over the threshold to get a full scholarship. Because okay, was like, let me just stop you there real quick. It just struck me that some people don't know what FAM is. Oh yeah, FAM, right. Florida a &M University. <clears throat> it was a historically black yep. university in Tallahassee. In Tallahassee, and um, so yeah, it was. It was. I made sure that I did just enough to get the Distinguished Scholars Award, which gave me a full ride which meant I had to get like a 1200 on the SAT. Mm -hmm. And I think it was above three, five GPA. I had the three, three, five GPA. And I took the SAT a couple of times. I kept killing the math. I got mm -hmm. perfect on the math. I just, <laughs> the, the, the English was killing me. And I took a couple of times. I got like, I think I got like 480 one time. And then I got 520 okay. <laughs> and okay. got just over the <laughs> Right, 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 right. Right. You but did, but you end up, you, you, you end up doing what you need to do when you get the scholarship. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's talk about your mother at this point. 
she's seen the transformation. Yeah, yeah. You know, at this time, um, now it's the, 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 the interaction is starting to switch between we're going to have to stay on you to like, now they're sitting back, like, let's, let's see what he does, you know, it's <laughs> like, let him go, you know? And so they gave me a lot of freedom, a lot of support, man. I'm, I'm always grateful to my parents. They did things that I wouldn't do as a parent today. Hmm. They, they. What was gave, your father's role in your academic? You, you mentioned your mother's that, that talking to, what role is your father playing in terms of your he was, academic? He, he was the right. example. You know, he's a quiet example. You okay. know, my father really laid a um, amazing foundation of what manhood and fatherhood and familyhood is supposed to look like. Because I'm just watching him do it every day. He's he's working essentially two jobs. You know, I'm seeing the interaction between him and my mom. I'm seeing the tirelessness. You know, like he get up, go do his thing. He come back, he don't complain, you know? And that that really formed a huge piece of the bedrock of like how I became, you know? Okay, so you, you say you got one sister? Yeah. You got one other older, siblings? No, nah, just one older, older sister. Okay. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so big thing that happened was McCullough invited me to do a second job in between high school and starting college. That's the professor who was an engineer who yep. gave you the uh, yep. pyramid yep. thing. Yeah. So he gives me another gig. This time it's work with my grad students on an actual research project that's like actually meaningful for his research. So in this project, we were actually studying earthquake responses uh, or tall buildings, how they respond to earthquakes. Because so he's, he's a civil engineer. Civil engineer, this was his, this was his research area. And he, um, that project was mind blowing because I learned how to code in MATLAB at that, you know, and that, I, it's so funny now thinking about it, it's like so far ahead of his time. Like, I, you know, like that's, you know, I was coding in MATLAB. I was using Simulink and learn how to solve differential equations. Okay. When you say coding in MATLAB, break it down for Yeah. For so, so MATLAB is a very popular easy, user-friendly, um, mathematical computing language uh, programming environment that's used to solve problems for engineers. Um, it is a level deeper than, um, like, it's a significant level deeper than, like, Excel or something like that, where you actually write code. And so I got exposed to this idea of coding um, I got exposed to this idea. Well, not just exposed, like I learned how to do it. You know, like I was writing my own code and I was running my own simulations, generating results. And he's the Were thing. Were you yeah. self-taught or they, they taught you that? No, I was with her working with a grad student. So there's a guy, his name was uh, Andy Richards. Okay. He was from St. Kitts. <laughs> okay. He was a uh, grad student, very cool brother. Um, that summer, I also started lifting weights with him because he was he was big in the weights. So me and him used to hang out. I used to go lift weights with him in the morning. Um, I remember I bulked up a lot that summer because they didn't want to. They got tired of taking the weights off <laughs> when it was my turn. They were right. like, "Man, just try it. Just try it out. <laughs> just like do one." <laughs> right. And so um, I ended up picking up a significant amount of weight, muscle mass that summer, just trying to do one. <laughs> um, but anyway, I used to hang out with them, and uh, it was a lot, a lot of fun, a lot, a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. And But the key thing was, out of that summer, Andy published a conference paper, and my name was on it. I think I, I, think I was like, I think I might have been the first or second author on this paper. That did wonders, because then, fast forward, now I'm in engineering school, freshman year, I go to the career fair. So now it's time to get an internship. And I'm the only one there with an actual like publication on my resume. So I stood out. That right. that triggered like so many things came together because now I'm getting my first internship as a freshman as opposed to one or two years later. And so that everything was like ahead of the game for me because of that. You know, so McCullough really put me on, man. Like he gave me that shot to do that. It worked out well. I learned a ton. 
um, <clears throat> and everything was just accelerated for me after that. So the next, so that next summer, so, so what I learned from that, I actually was a civil engineering major when I started at FAMU. And after You're I kind of walking that, in the footsteps of Macola. Exactly. Just cause yeah. like, that's what he does. I like, am yeah, just do civil. And right. so, um, I remember, um, after that project realizing like what I enjoyed about it so much was that something was moving. <laughs> and so it's the movement that was more interesting to me than, than the civil structure. So then I later decided to switch to mechanical. <clears throat> and so, um, I took a, so Inter motion, you were interested yeah. in motion, the science the of motion. And the vibration. Vibration in particular. Vibration is key. Okay. That comes up later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because okay. I was fascinated between, fascinated by the connection of vibration being simulated, that it happens in real life, and it's part of music. And did you get that? Did you get that from the earthquake yeah. in tall building study? Right, right, right. So I was like, huh. So what did you get from the earthquake and what, what was the outcome of that, that study? What was the conclusion? Uh, so that particular project was, was about if you put actuators in a building to resist an earthquake, like they actually pull and tug on the floors of the building to keep them from sliding with respect to each other. Okay, that's what an actuator is. Yeah, an, or an, an actuator is like a member that, uh, you could think of it like a hydraulic press that can push or pull on okay. something. Okay. And so it's kind of like, kind of like, uh, kind of like the shocks on your car. Okay. Um, so it can push and pull. Mm -hmm. uh, you put in electricity and it moves something. Um, just like hydraulics on a no, like hydraulics on a car where you, you know, drop the drag, you sit mm -hmm. there and bounce right. So it's that kind of thing. So imagine ginormous ones, huge ones that are in a building that are actually pulling and tugging on the floors when an earthquake is sensed. So it actually keeps the floors from shaking so much. Okay. So the question, the central research question was where in the building do you place these, these things, these hydraulics? What floors and how many and which locations and with what amount of strength? So it was like an optimization problem plan right, where, where right. you put them and then simulating the response. Right. So it was a bit of control theory um, and feedback loop in there. <clears throat> so that, that was fun. It was interesting. And I went and did a summer internship the next summer with uh, Visteon. It was like, like the kind of like the parts division of Ford. That was important because I quickly learned from that one internship that I did not want to go to industry. And mm, okay, let's get into that. Let's get into that. Let's yeah, into because that. are you so familiar I, with Sandy Monroe? Mm -mm. Okay, he he was either with Ford or GM. He's a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to send you some of his videos. I think you might find okay. it interesting. Um, okay. He was a me mechanical engineer for, for uh, Ford or GM, and he handles, um, he used to handle their manufacturing processes and the optimization of their manufacturing processes. And mm -hmm. now he does a lot of reviews on Tesla. Okay. Because, um, you know, I'm very big into Tesla. Mm -hmm. And he gives the, um, his critiques of mm -hmm. the car companies of today, where <clears> they're going, where they're failing, what Tesla is doing better than them and all that. I think you might find some of his, uh, okay. I mean, he has a YouTube channel. He, okay. He's an older guy. I think you might find it very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll send yeah, it please, to you. Please, please Sandy please. Monroe is his name. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, so you worked at GM. No, this was, this was, so Visteon was spun out as like the, it used to be the parts division of Ford. Parts division of Ford. Okay. Yep. And so. I got to see a lot that summer that was was pretty game changing for me. Um, number one, I was working and I got to see what it was like to be an industry engineer, how little actual engineering was being done. <laughs> you got a bachelor's in engineering, like like mostly do do Excel and answer emails. <laughs> you don't really do a whole lot of deeply mm. technical work. There wasn't um, a lot of creative work for you to do. Nah, I, they gave me a project which was they had seen on my resume that did this vibration thing. They had some failures. I was in the alternator division. They had some, they had some failures on some alternators of some wire bonds. And they had a hypothesis that maybe what was causing the failure was vibration, like the car vibrating. And maybe there was this like gel they had put over these circuits that might've been jiggling around in there and broke the wire bonds. So they wanted me to look at it. I did, you know, a little bit of analysis, did some testing, concluded a different answer was caused by something else. And 
I remember making a suggestion because it was like, really, what you need to do is this. And when 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 I saw the that new ideas were met with, like, well, that's gonna cost too much. We're not we're not even gonna entertain that. And even then, I took it further. I was like, that's a good point. Let me look at the cost. And I looked at the cost. And it was like some fraction of a cent mm -hmm. that it would cost on a on a hundred dollar alternator. And they didn't want to make the change. And then, there, so that was a really big eye opener for me. The other big eye opener for me that summer, I remember the very first day we go to Visteon, they give like a corporate presentation and stuff. And they show where Visteon's revenue is. And it's like bigger than McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a company I'd never even heard of. And they're bigger than McDonald's. Like, <laughs> and that opened my world to the fact that like this, the companies that run the world, you don't even you probably don't even know their names. Yeah. You know, I realized that that summer I was working on this particular thing. It turned out, I mean, like the alternator is sold by Visteon, but it's actually made by Philips. And so then I'm like, Philips, the people that make the headphones and the CD players, like they make alternators, like they make certain like these. There's like companies that do things that I didn't realize they do because there's no right. commercial, there's no right. advertisement. Right. And then you start to realize the amount of money they make is so obscenely large i was like i never i just i just had no idea i had no idea and so that started to shift me to like well i want to i want to I, I want what they got i want to <laughs> i want to get in that lane you know i thought mcdonald's was big right these these are this is a whole nother level so that you want to get in that lane in terms of having your own engineering firm or i wanted to invent something okay and get to that place inventor. Yeah, I wanted to come up with something. And I hated the idea that if I was working at a company and I came up with something, they own would, it. They own it. Yeah. Like all I can do is make the the white people that already own the stuff more rich. Right. Like and so I hated that idea that like I could go work for a company and anything I come up with is just is just gonna right. make more money. Right. And they even they call if, it a work for hire in legal parlance. So um, <clears throat> those things turned me off from industry. The very next summer, um, McCullough was back. And he, man, he, I mean, it's just so interesting. That, again, huge turning point. He, um, he asked me, he says, well, I just, want, I just want you to work for me this summer. I think you're very smart. I, want you, I just want to work with you. I'm like, but I'm a mechanical engineer. I don't do that civil stuff no more. I'm not, not interested in that. And he says to me, um, so now, for people who aren't following, who aren't keeping track of this, is that you're actually now a student at the university that he teaches right. at now. Right, right, right. Is he right. your professor in any classes? No, I'm not. He's in a different department. Okay. <clears throat> so I go hang out with him. I talk with him because uh, he's still a good, very close mentor of mine. Was he like, disappointed that you decided to become a mechanical engineer instead of civil? No, nah, no. Nah, okay. He was. He was cool. He was like, you know, go do it. Um, <clears throat> but then this was, conversation was interesting because now he's like, but I want you to work for me. <laughs> and I'm like, but I don't do none of that stuff you do. He was, and, and his response was very, very deep because he goes, um, <clears throat> that's all right. You, you, you pick whatever you want to do and I'll pay you to do it. And I'll figure out how to relate it to civil engineering on the back end. I just want you to work for me. And I was like, what do you mean I get to do whatever I want? He was like, you make up the project. Mm -hmm. You tell me what project you want to do, and I'll pay you to do it. Okay. I was like, what? That so this is after your stint at GM, at Ford? At uh, Ford, yeah. Uh, do, okay, yep. so now you're going to a very restricted place, and then you now he's giving you autonomy. Freedom. He was yeah, like, you freedom. come up with it. So, um, so I was bugging. I was like, that's an interesting offer. All right, so I'm going to think about it. What do I want to do? So <clears throat> around the same time, or like earlier that year, in the school year, I had taken physics too. So then physics of electricity and magnetism. Mm. That was a big turning point. Because, you know, until you learn that stuff, you don't even know what electricity is. Like, it's just something that happens. <laughs> you know, and so I took it actually at FSU. <clears throat> right. yeah, this is, this is Nikola Tesla territory right now, right? Yeah, and right. and the the professor, <clears throat> I forget his name, but he was very good. And he did a demo in class. Blew my mind, man. Like blew my mind. So blew we do. He, 
he does this he does this whole derivation of the speed of light and i'm like mind blown I'm like whoa like i actually followed all of that like okay so like there's like a speed and it's always the same speed okay okay so then he derives what should happen in this situation and he's like i'm i'm gonna show you we're gonna he has basically on a table on a desk in the front of the class this is like a pretty big auditorium type class like 100 200 students and there's a lot of people so he's got on a table um basically an antenna so it's a metal rod and mm -hmm. he's got two wires on it so he's sending a voltage and the electrons are sloshing back and forth inside the metal you can't see anything but it's just like he's just telling you that's what's happening like that's what mm -hmm. i just did <clears throat> and so he's explaining because that's happening you have charge um charge particles accelerating so therefore the change in electric field should induce a change in the magnetic field so there should be an oscillating electric and magnetic field going outward in this direction and it's oscillating back and forth in alignment with the with the antenna so then he has a light bulb with a two that's like plugged in and it's got two other metal rods sticking out from it and he's holding it deliberately vertically <laughs> and it's like so because the field is not aligned with this pole nothing's happening i'm just moving the electrons in this pole they feel the electric field of these ones moving and he goes to the other side of the classroom. He's like, he's like 30 yards away. And he says, all right, now I'm gonna show you what happens. <laughs> and then he just grabbed, he just turns it sideways and the motherfucking light bulb came on. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was blown. I was like, yo, yo. <laughs> I was like, yo, this shit's moving through space. He's right. He's right. Like, you know, like them demos, man, it really like sets right. your brain. I was like, oh, that's, it's really, that's like, right. all this shit I'm learning is for real. Like, it's, right. not, it's not just theory. Like, right. this really right. happening. Like, he, he said that's just how, it's how it should happen. Like, as soon as you align, it's like, the electrons start moving and the light bulb comes on. It's like, right. oh. So, <laughs> you know, I was, I was so hyped about magnetic induction from that right. year. The very and my my homeboy Omari, he was also we were roommates. Okay, so that's when the I same learned, Omari. That's the same Omari. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so basically y'all are on the same path. Yeah, yeah. So he he actually <laughs> he uh, anyway it's a long story, but anyway, so we um I'm telling him about magnetic induction, and I and I remember this because this is this is these were part of the things that really helped me realize that I wasn't normal. Because the very first thing, I mean, I, I want to say it was like maybe a day or two after seeing that lecture, the very first thing that comes to my mind was was essentially a hybrid car. I was like, oh, if that's how that works, then why are we wasting energy on the brakes? You should just make the brakes a magnet and store the energy. Then you don't have to, like, this is, this is exactly this is where my mind went. And, and around time, what year is this? This is this was actually before I went to Visteon. Now that I remember, because I remember, I was explaining the idea to people at Visteon, and at that at that time, Ford was working on it, and they were calling it the Integrated Alternator. Uh, what did they call it? The Integrated Alt Alternator Motor. That was the name of it. And they showed me the lab. Like I got to visit. It was like a group of people working on trying mm. to figure out how to like do this. And mm -hmm. and I was like, I was sad because I didn't. I didn't, I wasn't the first to figure it out, but later I realized I like, I should have been proud of myself because that, that the idea occurred to me immediately as soon as I understood. That's that. what they're referring to right now as regenerative braking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Regenerative braking immediately came to my mind as soon as I learned, understood the physics behind it. Interesting. You know? And so then I started to later realize like, you know, um, I don't think, you know, like Ford's been making cars for 50 years. And they're just now getting like they've been knowing this physics because that's actually how the right, alternate right. They, they should have, the they should have, they should have been on this. They should have done that. Yeah, long like time I mean, ago. my thing is like, as soon as you know how that works, why would you make a car any other way? Like that right. doesn't make any sense. Like why would you not do that? <laughs> like that's right. where my mind was. Like wow, that's that just makes sense. And right. so, where that led was then I was I was always fascinated with magnetic induction. Magnetic induction is still to this day is super fascinating. And so. Um, when Makola said, all right, well, you do whatever you want. I was like, all right, I want to harness the energy of an earthquake then. <laughs> <laughs> so I okay. had this idea 
that I'm going to put a huge mass on top of a building. I'm going to strap a ton of magnets to it. And so when the building starts moving, instead of using actuators to stop it, I'm going to use magnetic induction to slow it down. I'm going to actually suck the energy out of the earthquake in the building. And that's how I'm going to slow the building down. Then I'm going to use the energy. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's walk this through. Let's walk this through. Yeah. Okay. Let's walk it through. An earthquake so, happens. Yep. So you have a mass on the top of the building. When the earthquake happens, this mass begins shaking with the building. Okay. The mass has lots of magnets, essentially a huge magnet strapped to it. So when this magnet now begins moving relative to a coil, so you need a bunch of wire. Okay. When a magnetic field moves relative to a coil, it induces a current in the coil. Right. This current, you can now charge a battery or something. You, could, you, could, you can use the energy. But when you suck the energy out, it actually creates a reactionary force that slows that mass down. And so you're actually absorbing the energy of the earthquake into this mass and then sucking it out and converting it to electricity. So it's the it. idea that you can convert motion to electricity. Got it, got it. Because of the movement of the magnets vis-a-vis yep. -vis the coils in yep. respect to the coils exactly. causing some yep. type of conductive force. Exactly. And there's great videos of it on YouTube. If you Google um, magnetic induction, there's some really cool videos of like people will take a magnet, they have like a big cylinder of copper and you spin it and then you drop it and it drops through the coil, through the cylinder, but it's much slower than gravity's like would normally pull it. Mm -hmm. So it actually falls really slow. It's like really slowly going down because of oh, the wow. reactionary force pushing up on the magnet as it's falling. Then when it gets to the bottom, it falls out. So they have, they have some videos like that on YouTube? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, so, so that idea of energy conversion <clears throat> was really, really, I was really hot on that idea. And so, um, okay. so I so wanted now to... Now I'm starting to see your path to the whole renewable energy thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm starting yeah. to see it. I'm starting to see it. Okay. And, and vibration. That's the other okay. thing. Yeah, <laughs> vibration. <laughs> because of music. Yeah, music and also... The fascination with things moving and going back and forth and like this frequency content and like the frequencies correspond to like you could make them correspond to notes and like you know there's just this, this whole spectrum of things happening right. simultaneously right. <clears throat> so later actually a few years ago um so i called it i never forget i called it the, i had made up my own name it's called the structural magnetic induction damper you know i had like i had a whole thing like i was right. <laughs> i was hyped on my own concept right and so um, that was a really, really powerful experience. And, and it was, I would say out of that experience that I came away with like, okay, I want to be a professor. Because I realized that what I did that summer, I enjoyed that, that autonomy so much to be able to just let my mind go and be creative and come up with something. And then not just come up with something, I get to go analyze it. Like I get, I'm getting paid to go figure it out, to try to design it, to do the due diligence and actually see if it's going to work. <clears throat> that whole process, I fell in love with that. You know, it was the this is, this is a university now, fam. You. Yeah. Well, even even more interesting, he he, I think wanted me to work with him because he had <clears throat> formed a partnership for a program to send kids doing undergraduate research to Tokyo for the summer. So I actually spent a month in Tokyo. That interesting. Summer. So that in of itself was a whole mind blowing experience as well to like actually be in another country at that age, you know, for a whole month. Well, um, what, what did you see? Let me ask you a little bit about Japan. What did you see when you got to Japan in terms of the difference in academic competition or where they were in terms of engineering, if any? Um, <clears throat> it was it was mind blowing. The biggest difference that I was largely focused on at that time was cell phones their cell phones were way more advanced than ours were. So I remember, so at that time, you know, we had flip phones mm -hmm. and flip phones could maybe last a day and they had batteries in their flip phones that could make them last a week. And that was just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. We were just getting the blue screens and they had full color screens. I was like, yo, their, their phone's on a whole nother level. <laughs> right. They had texting. We hadn't, we had text messaging yet. Right. They had texting and all kind of stuff. So I was blown by the, by the cell phone usage. Um, I was also blown by all kinds of things. I mean, it's just like, it's a lot of little things, but you realize they add up. You know, I remember going there and I saw what was the equivalent of 
a um, what is it called? Um, Acura. What is it called? Um, what's the big Acura called? Um, oh, no, I just remember Acura Legend and Acura. The Legend. Integra. The Legend. Oh, the Legend. Okay. Yes. And I saw Acura Legend in Japan, but it wasn't called Legend. Hmm. And I was like. Oh, so in other countries, they give them different names. Like, they have different names. Right. It's the exact same vehicle, but, like, the naming is mm -hmm. branding. Like, and I started right. to realize, like, that's just some stuff they made up for us to, like, right. want to buy it. Like, it's the same vehicle being sold, but they give it different titles. Mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, so my mind was just really being open into all that. And you realize, like, okay, these companies, I think another piece of it was, like, these companies are really, um, <clears throat> what they do, how they operate, they make their own decisions. They do whatever they do. And we're just like subject to whatever choices they make, right. <laughs> you know? Right. And um, so these things all made me want to think more on entrepreneurship. Like I was like, I want my own. Like I, I really want my own. What did you see in terms of um, the intellectual wherewithal with the Japanese students in comparison to students you saw in America, if there was any difference at all? Um, <clears throat> not a ton. I think what was pleasantly surprising, and these are things that really help bolster your confidence, is like it was it was a big deal that we two brothers, it was me and this other brother named Sundiata, <clears throat> and two black men was over there, and and we were just like pleasantly surprised, like we can hang, like like we can hang with them, you know, because we from FAMU. They right. they were at Tokyo University. Tokyo University is like the equivalent of Harvard in Japan. Right. You know, it's like their best university. Um, I remember there was a guy who f was from a company. He gave a presentation. We went on some field trip. And I remember McCullough walking out of that presentation saying that was the, that was the best PowerPoint presentation I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it was this guy, he had, um, he was from some company. Their level of, the reason we were in Japan with this earthquake thing is because uh, Japan gets a lot of earthquakes. So the, the technology that he, we were researching is actually being used in Japan. So we got to actually see it being used. And so they're actually further ahead on it than-, than So than this was your whole harnessing the earthquake energy yeah. thing? Well- Did you know that they were doing that in Japan? When you came no, no they, nobody was doing that specific thing, but like other mitigation strategies they were doing. And so um, um, this, this particular presentation, I mean, I remember it was very, very vividly. Um, they were using something called magnetorheological fluids. Mm -hmm. So these are fluids that their fluid properties change depending upon the strength of the magnetic field they're susceptible to. So what this meant is you could actually make a damper for a building and its damping coefficient could change dynamically. So they were okay, using- Okay, damper a, for a building. Yeah. Let's speak in-, in, in, in Oh, in sorry, of... sorry, sorry. <laughs> so think of this like your shocks. So this is like okay. your shocks and dampers in your car. Your car bounces. It only bounces about once or so before it stops bouncing. It's okay. got springs underneath it. Without the damper, it would just keep oscillating okay. for a while. Is that the same thing you were talking about earlier when you were talking um, about? Or is that that's something different? That's different. So an actuator actually right. forces against it and- uses energy to do that a damper dissipates the energy got it yeah got it just it, it just heats so up. an actuator is actually active active yes okay got and it. a damper is passive okay got it and so um um this they had this this technique where they had um placed these dampers in a building and the and the fluid basically you can think of it as the viscosity of the fluid can change in time depend like they got coils wrapped around and they can change the fluid viscosity so basically it can become really stiff and and you can't push it or it can become loose and it can slide mm -hmm. easy and they can change that dynamically so as the earthquake is happening it's changing its viscosity to match and actually pull to keep the building from being able to move and so he what had, controls what controls the viscosity the magnetic field they have a coil oh. bill wrapped around it and so they're electronically sensing how the building is moving and then they're feeding that to a process that's making decisions about how strong the magnetic field should be. And so he gave this whole presentation on all the math and all the theory behind doing that decision-making. 
Wow. And he goes on, there's all these equations, these crazy equations. And you are, there get computer, lost. are there computers involved? Oh, yeah. In, okay, there's computers involved in changing yeah. the, the viscosity in terms of Absolutely. the calculus? Okay. Absolutely. And so he was going through, his presentation was about, he basically wrote the program that makes the decision for what the viscosity should be at a given point in time. Got it. Based got on it. all the sensor data. Got it. Got it. And so he shows all this math and it's like overwhelming. So he's just like, I don't know if I follow any of this math. But he just keeps going. He gets to his like last slide and he has a video. And it was, you know, McCullough was so impressed because I, I, I didn't appreciate it until he explained it later. They went and made their own building to test it. <laughs> so they created a building. Just to test it. Just to test it. So they put, they put this thing in this building because they had to put the building on a huge actuator to shake it. So there's a huge actuator in the basement that's actually forcing the building to move. So they have all the executives from the company on the top floor. They're sitting and they have a, it's so funny, they, the Japanese are kind of interesting. They have a, a fish tank on a table. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the, the people were kind of mm -hmm. shaking and the fish tank water is sloshing everywhere. And he goes, and now we're gonna turn on the damper system. <laughs> And they're all shaking and he pushes on and then everybody just stops moving. <laughs> wow. And it was like, it was like magic. It was like wow. magic. And it was like such a beautiful illustration of like all this math turned into like, we can keep the building from moving, you know? Yeah. And so these are the kinds of things that just like reinforce in my mind. It's like this math is, is powerful. Yeah, man. You know, it's like, they're not doing, it's not random. The earthquake yeah. is random. But they're doing something very calculated to counteract it that actually keeps it still. Yeah. You know? It's random. It's random when it strikes, but yeah. it's uniform in its behavior after it strikes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. That's and that's what allows the math to come in. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so all of these examples, things I experienced, they just really reinforce very deep. Are you? Are you <laughs> at this time when you're seeing this thing? Are you aware? or appreciative of the fact that you're seeing things on this planet that most people don't get to see? I, I wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't, not at that time. Not at that time, no. Um, it was just normal, it was just normal for you because that's what you're it, in. It was cool, I just didn't think like that, like other mm -hmm. people don't, because I, I guess, here, maybe, here's maybe the thing. I didn't think of it like that because I felt like other people could if they were interested. Like, right. like there's nothing special about me. Like I just, right. I'm happy to be here, but it's because I wanted to be here. Like right. I asked and, you know, you know, right. but it's like a bunch of folks could be here. They're just not interested, you know? So are you like at this time, because you're immersed in this, this is what excites you. Do you find it difficult to relate with your other peers of your age group or, or is it just all engineers you around it? Cause you know, during this time in university, you know, it's on and popping. Yeah. You know, we're young, you're yep. strong. Yep. You know what I mean? You have different types of social relationships with different yeah. types of people. And do you find you're like in an enclave of engineers? Because so I, where you're at right now, I used to party at MIT. Uh, right. Yes. So uh -huh. it was called Chocolate City. When I was at, I went to yeah. Tufts University just down the street. So Tufts yeah, University, yeah, yeah. Harvard, yep. and MIT used to all party together. We all used to party. And then We'd have parties at um, where I was at, which was the, um, the African American Center, mm -hmm. right? It was called Cape and House. That's where we used to throw down. And so mm -hmm. all the cats from Harvard and all the cats from MIT would come whenever we had parties. And then Harvard had its Black Students Union. And there was mm -hmm. a place where we partied in Harvard. I forgot where that place was called, but Chocolate City was the highlight of them all. <laughs> it was the legendary place where you went to party. But what was really interesting about it was it was black engineers, right. but they were also very well-rounded people yeah. who took a lot of pride in being engineers. I remember there was one guy there. I wonder what he's doing this to this day, but people only knew him as um, double MS. Some mm. people call him double. Mm. And that was just his name until you like find out what that stood for. Like what did double stand for? It's like, oh, well, double ms that's the name uh, and what does that mean master of math and science <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm i mean we're, we're 1920 like in our heyday uh -huh. and this is what the type of that's the type of vibration yeah. these cats are on right you know what i'm saying so it's like 
they were normal dudes. They want to party, chase girls, just like with all of us. You know, I was, yeah. I wasn't into engineering, yeah. but you know, MIT was where it was popping in terms mm -hmm. of party, and they took it seriously. Like <laughs> City, that's what it was. It was like, oh, there's a party, chocolate. Like we would cancel all of our plans and all the parties that we were gonna have because there was gonna be a chocolate city party at MIT. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So it's crazy that that's where you're there now. That yeah. That's where you're at now, because that used to be my stomping grounds. That's where Jungle, all the- Jungle City is still around. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah. But at this time when you're like 19, 20, 21, yeah. and this is like your excitement, you're seeing all these exciting things, and you're having, I would imagine you're having dreams and thoughts of different inventions and different mathematical formulas and what the possibilities are and, and all that. What type of circle are you around? Are you, because you're at FAMU, are you seen as weird or you cannot talk to certain people about certain things or, well, how, how does that it go? Was, um, it was pretty compartmentalized. You know, I had regular friends, people who hang out, we do all the regular stuff. We don't talk, we don't talk engineering, we don't talk about any science, any science or whatever. Right. You know, the culture at FAM was largely, there was like one other cat that I was really uh, cool with, close with uh, James Finley. Me and him could talk and relate on like, this stuff is actually pretty cool. But other than that, everybody else was treating it like, man, this stuff is hard, man. I'm just trying to get through this class and I ain't trying to do all this work. So I wasn't really bought into that culture, but um i also wasn't really celebrating like oh man this is this is this engineering stuff is so much fun right. it was interesting it was intriguing but I, it was only a few people i could really share that aspect with at that time so things were pretty compartmentalized and how it, well, important do you think it is to have people you can share that with at that at that age uh, or is it important or does it even matter i don't know <clears throat> um I had to give some thought to how much of a difference that made. I, I kind of feel like for me, at least in the place that I was at, what I was going to do and where I was headed was so settled in my mind. It kind of didn't really need peer reinforcement. Um, but it was great to have it. Mm -hmm. you but know? you were independently excited. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I think maybe what meant more was to see Macola get excited. Mm. The guy I looked up to, to see him hyped and to see, cause there, to see that it was cool. He could be cool and be excited about it. And, you know, I, I distinctly remember, I do remember the day cause I knew I wanted to be an engineer. I knew I wanted to be, I was thinking about becoming a professor around this time when I did the structural magnetic induction damper. And I distinctly remember the uh the rakim album came out around that time which one uh, the 18th letter uh yeah because he had he had this long stretch of nothing right he dropped the album so yeah the 18th happening. letter yeah okay and um i remember the single I, yeah i couldn't remember the, the titles of the song but i remember the single and so um mccullough was a big rakim head oh interesting yeah so when rakim when that album came out i remember he also was into basketball he also used to play basketball a lot and I remember going in his office, he had his speakers turned up loud, bumping the new rock cam. He had his feet up on the desk. He had a t-shirt on, some sweatpants and some sneakers because he just came from playing basketball. And he had his feet up on the desk doing some work. And I walked in to talk to him and, and that imagery really stuck with me because I was like, this is a guy who's at the top of his game on the engineering thing, but he doesn't have to wear the, 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 jackets with the little pads and all right. that he doesn't right. look like what you would think is a professor right but he's at the top of his game like that look does not have to translate to you if you don't want it to like you can be you and and do right. this so i think though the combination of all those things around that time i was like i, I want to be a professor i want to be a professor i want to start a company and i want to be able to pursue what i want to pursue and have that freedom okay. and so um we're now, in terms of pursuing this um, professorship, right? Were you a bit cautious of working for a university 
and at the same time your intellectual property being claimed by a university? No, I actually didn't even understand they had that at that time. Okay. Um, but you understood that for industry though at I the did. time. I okay, did. but not for universities. Okay. Right. right. <clears throat> and so um, the next summer, um, oh, another key thing. So that year, I think, is when I took thermal fluids, key course, because this is where the connection of vibration and heat came. Is then I was always interested in vibration. Then come to find out, like, temperature is like a measure of the amount that the atoms are vibrating. Right. And I became intrigued with that. I'm like, <laughs> your, whole, whole, your whole MO is vibration. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, man, so That's the crazy. whole world is vibrating? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like fascinated, but I'm like, man, so everything's making music right now. We just can't hear it. <laughs> wow. You know, and so I became fascinated with that. Did you ever um, end up studying music theory? No, no, none. Um, so then that led to, it was around this time, McCullough gave me some really amazing advice. You know, he says, all right, well, if you want to, you, you know, if you want to be a professor, you want to do research, you got to be a professor, you're going to be a professor, you're going to have to get a PhD. If you want to get a PhD, you're going to have to do some, you're going to have to do research, you have to do a project. And the key thing is you got to really love what you do research wise. That's what will get you through. It's not about the school. It's not about the advisors. It's like you really have to be in love with the work. And so he was like, all right, <clears throat> what you need to do is I want you to try to read papers. I want you to try to figure out what you want to do research on because that's key. Read papers. You're not going to understand them, but just try. And certain words and stuff is going to stick out to you. And I want you to start saving the papers that are most interesting, interesting to you. Mm. And take a look at the last author on these papers and you're going to start seeing the same name popping up on the papers that you're most interested in. Figure out who that person is, figure out what school they're at and email them. Send them a copy of your resume, say something to indicate that you are black. Tell them you want to work with them for a summer and if they don't have money, you'll find money. Okay. <laughs> he so gave you like the whole instruction manual. That, that right, was that right, was the words. Right, right, right. He <laughs> gave you. He he told you what to do. He told yeah. you step by step, and that's very important because if you don't know that, you end up reinventing the wheel, right? So, or just walking in the forest blind, yep. right? So, what what is the meaning when he tells you the last author on the paper? What does yes, that mean? Yeah, so basically, when you see scientific works done, the last author is the most senior author. That's Got the person it. who ran, who intellectually ran the whole operation. It was their ideas. All the people in front of them are the people who did the work, you know, their ideas. And so they get listed last, seemingly as least important, but it means they did the least amount of work because they actually did the intellectual work. Got it. Got it. So... so so the it's kind of like the post grads are the first ones listed. Yep. And, and then the full professor. And postdocs and then the okay. faculty members at the end. Got All it. the faculty members are towards the end if there's multiple, but the one who like it's their idea. The most senior yeah. person in terms of this concept is. Yep. Yep. Is the last author. Okay. Got it. Yep. So that's the uh, one who wins the Nobel Prize if there's one to be won. Well, actually, all the paper, people on the paper win. They, oh, most Nobel Pri yeah, yeah, most, win. Yeah, okay. yeah, mostly with the Nobel Prizes, they're shared. They're usually shared by lots of people. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so if it's a Nobel Prize, it would be all the authors on that paper. Pretty much, yeah. For that paper. Yeah. The breakthrough in that paper. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, so, and I'm sure there's a whole conversation we can have about these papers and what they're about, how they're, you know, put together and right. some of the mechanics and even the politics involved in some of these things. Indeed. Um, yeah, and I, I think we can have a follow-up conversation sometime where you can enlighten um, people on um, some of the rigors mm -hmm. of the academic world yeah. at that level. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to send you some video from a guy named Eric Weinstein. Okay. Uh, he has a podcast. Okay. Very interesting stuff. So I'm, I'm going to send you... Okay. Um, he talks about the world of the, you know, the PhDs. Mm. Um, he's a mathematician mm. and uh, his brother is a biologist called Brett Weinstein. And I listen to their podcast. They both have separate podcasts and 
um, they have bones to pick with the world of academia because they got burned. And you talk about the process and paper writing and who gets yeah. named on the papers and where the ideas come from. And I think it's very interesting. So I would love to hear your comments. It might not be a podcast, but it may be something where you can, you know, give me your opinion sure. through your experience. So you're given these directions. Who do you end up calling? Who do you end up emailing? Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting story. So the guy's name who shows up is a guy named Gong Chen. <laughs> Gong Chen. Gong Chen. Um, <clears throat> just so happens he's a professor at MIT. And at that time, I didn't really. I think it was around that time I was even getting familiar with what MIT even was because I'd never even really heard. Okay. Okay. Of it. And so um, this. And, was, and what, what's Don Chen vibing on? Gong Chen is all about thermoelectrics. It was heat and electricity. It was the two pieces that I liked. I was like, man, thermoelectricity. So you tell me his name keeps way... showing up on these papers. Yeah, yeah, because it's like there's it was nanoscale, heat transfer, and electricity all at the same time. It's just fascinating. It's like the atomic level plus heat, plus you get to make electricity. It's like, man, so you're telling me all I can put in heat and I can get electricity out with no moving parts? Mm, like he yeah, a paper like they mentioned an application. I remember this line stood out to me. They were like, we, you know, thermoelectrics could be used to make a body heat powered wristwatch. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> That's cool. Right. You know, like right. your own right. body heat could power devices. Right. So, right. The, you know, right. and, and now is, I know. This like, is great, man. This is great, man, because like listening to what you're saying, mm -hmm. like, I'm so excited. Because, <laughs> no, I'm serious, man. You yeah. don't you don't even know because here's why I'm excited. And this is for the listening audience is that um, again, I was involved in the solar mm. energy field in a very, you know, non-scientific way. Um, but I had run across your work just on Facebook because we were Facebook friends through other people. And so um, you were posting your work uh, that you were doing in terms of uh, solar, in terms of thermal, solar thermal mm -hmm. work that you'd done. And um, I was looking at these, um, I think, what do they call them? Frenzes lenses or something like that. Something Fresnel. Fresnel. Yeah. Fresnel lenses, yes. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, so I found the stuff that you were doing very interesting. And it was, it was just really nice to see a brother was doing it at such a high level. Mm. And so I looked at the work that you were doing and always had it in the back of my head. But like, what's so crazy is listening to you talking about how you got there, <laughs> right? Because yeah. as you start piecing every single thing together, uh, I'm starting to see how it builds up to your work on this project that you yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, it's like, I'm seeing the puzzle being put mm -hmm. together. Like step by every minute you're talking, I'm saying, okay, that's how he got there. Yeah, <laughs> that's yep. that, that's why I'm so excited to hear to hear this. So now Don, so Dong Chen, Gong, Dong Chen, yeah, Gong Chen, G A N G, <laughs> Gong, Gong, yep. Okay, Gong. Okay, like tough Gong, <laughs> Gong Chen, Gong Chen. Okay, yep. <laughs> okay, Gong Chen. <laughs> Gong Chen. He's all he's all about. Okay, so he's about that thermal life. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, this and this, you, you raise a really interesting point about reconciling being into this stuff and the social aspect, because that for me was the biggest shift in going to MIT and working with him for a summer. So, so anyway, let me tell you what happened. So McCullough tells me to do this. So I, I do it. I send him an email. I tell him like I've been a member of Nesby for several years. I say he knows I'm black. <laughs> Yeah, so what was the value of that? That they were looking for so, diversity? Yeah, okay. yeah, because Makola was clear, you know, a lot of schools, you know, if you got a student that's black, that's actually, you know, excelling, mm -hmm. then they should do extra to try to get them. Right. So I put that in the email, sent him, you know, and he, he I remember I sent it at like maybe 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I was sitting in the engineering school. I think I was thinking about maybe other people to email. And within an hour, he sent a reply back. And I was blown away because I was just like, this dude's working on a Saturday? Because this is before, hand, you know, emails wasn't on phones then. This meant he was at his computer. Right. <laughs> Somebody right. replies to the email. Right. And I was like, and he says, um, looked at your resume, looks good. Um, I'd be happy to work with you. 
However, I don't have any money. So if you can find some money since you offered, then then I'll be happy to work with you. So my next, you know, thing immediately, I don't even think it was, I don't even know if Google had taken over at that point. Search engine, something. Yahoo. Like, or Yahoo. Something, Yahoo. Yahoo, something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like AOL. trying to be, <laughs> AOL. <laughs> so um, I looked up, um, you know, MIT summer research funding, you know, <laughs> And the first thing that comes up is uh, MSI, MS, MIT Summer Research Program. So it turns out MIT actually has a program for minorities to do exactly this. So I go, I'm looking at the site and um, I look at the deadline. The deadline passed like a week or two ago. And I'm like, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned it to McCullough. McCullough, McCullough would come through with this sage advice, man. <laughs> He he is such an integral part of how I got where I'm at because he he said certain things at the right moment, and that advice was so key. He says um, he was like apply anyway. He was like send them an application anyway. He said make them tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. Make them tell you no. Right. And so I was like, all right. That's a valuable lesson in life. Yeah, I'm like I'm after the deadline. He was like put it in anyway. <laughs> I send this thing in, and I think. I think he even told me, call him. He said, call him up. Call him up and ask him if you can put in a, a, a application late. I was like, all right. And I call up and it was a guy named Roy Charles. Roy Charles ran the program at that time. I talked to Roy Charles and he's like, wait a minute. So you're telling me you have a faculty member that's has already agreed to work with you? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you're in. <laughs> I'm like, what do you what do you mean? It's like, like they didn't have to like, match you with anybody. Yeah. He was like, that's one of the hardest things we have to do is get faculty members to accept y'all. Right. He's like, if you already hooked that up, right. They like, got the money. They yeah. Got the money. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't care about the deadline. He was like, yeah. I was I was blown away by that. So I ended up in the program. So I ended up going up there for a summer. I'm at MIT. That was a whole interesting experience. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Right. Because that's outside of Japan. That's yeah. your first time, like in terms of academically outside of Tallahassee, right? Yeah. And um, key thing that really stood out to me is the thing you were pointing out, which is prior to that point, I thought it was cool, like to me, all this stuff. But then I got to see at MIT, it was the culture of the whole place. Like everybody is so immersed in it. Everybody thinks it's cool. Yeah. Like that's all anybody wants to do. <laughs> so, so, so it's a different thing because like now that's all they talk about they right. don't talk about nothing else that's all right. they talk about right right so it got to a point where for me i had a bit of an identity crisis because i'm like well no nah, i still listen to hip-hop i still do other stuff like right. hey, i ain't right. just oh, i don't just do right. this you know right, right. <laughs> and right. um and that became a bit of an identity thing that i had to get over and i didn't really but is it not also kind of stepping your game up? Definitely, definitely, definitely. And I ended up, so he wrote me a re re letter of recommendation. I ended up getting in. Um, then I did MSRP again the summer before I started. And um, it wasn't until a few years into grad school that I was actually like, I, I distinctly remember around the time I was. It was okay, like wait, hold on. You say he wrote you a recommendation, you ended up getting in. Who is he and in uh, uh, So Gong Chen. The professor I was working with that mm -hmm. summer wrote me a recommendation letter when it came admissions time to apply for grad school. Okay. So this is your end. This is the end of your college career. Yep. You decide you want to get which what is a master's degree? Uh, I was I was clear I only wanted to do PhD, but they would advise you you need to do a master's first instead of going straight PhD. But you're allowed to if you really want to. So what did you do? You went straight. I went to master's. PhD? And PhD. You went, went master's, master's yeah. then. So he wrote you. A recommendation to get into MIT to get a master's degree it's weird it's like it's he's he's writing it because he knows that I want to do a PhD so that's actually key like even though it means you're doing a master's with we, we know you have the intention of staying to do the PhD that's actually okay. really important okay um, so yeah it is technically the master's but like nobody says it like that it's like okay. you're coming to do a PhD but you're gonna do the master's first okay yeah. all right and how so, many years uh, is the master's it's two Okay, and then Probably. how many years is the PhD? Indeterminate. <laughs> right. It's when you're so done. Whenever you get your thing off, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
So you're applying to be there for at least, I mean, you're, you're definitely PhD, but you get a master's degree conferred after two years? Yeah. Okay. So obviously your summer with Dong, with Gong Chen went very well. Yeah. I didn't know though. You know, he didn't really, I only saw him. What was like, it like when you first met him? So I met him. We talked for maybe five minutes. He passed me off to his Because in your mind, this guy's a legend, right? I didn't really think of it like that. No, you didn't think about it like that? Nah, I mean, it was, um, I was fat. I, 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 MIT was the legend. I didn't really okay. necessarily associate that with him. I just was fascinated with the work in general. Okay. You know, and so I just wanted to, I, I was kind of clear I wanted to maybe go there for grad school. So I wanted to do well that summer. Okay, and how did you how did you adapt to Boston that summer? That was rough, man. That was rough, actually. <laughs> was, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I. Uh, you spent was, time in Harvard Square. Nah, no? I was mostly I was mostly on campus. I didn't have a car, so okay. no, I was they got just, a great train system there. I wasn't that adventurous. I wasn't doing oh, all wow. that. I was largely on campus. There was a couple people in the program that did have cars, so I used to ride with them to spots. I had a friend that was in Boston named Chioma, uh, who I knew from Tallahassee, I kind of grow, grown up with. Okay. She was living there, so I used to see her sometime and go out sometime. She she uh, introduced me to some people and some friends in Boston, so I made some friends that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was rough. It was rough. No, oh, okay. Uh, but it was better. It was better than it could have been because there's other black people in the program. So I used to hang with them, and we just, you know, I guess we used to take taxis and go into Boston, go to clubs and stuff. We okay. wasn't really on the train like that, though. Okay. Not that much. Um, so yeah, you know, I got I got through all of that. Um, got into MIT. There's so many stories to tell, but long story short. There was this very one important one to tell, which is this. So I got in MIT, then I come to start grad school. And I was basically starting a summer early because I wanted to get a head start. I wanted to move fast. So I go to Gong's office. He says, um, so you're here, you know, what do you want to do? And it's one of those fateful moments where in that moment I said, well, um, I've always been interested in how atoms move. That's what you said. Like, yeah. Let me, let me like, stop you. Let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. When you interned for him the first time, what did you yeah. work on? Yeah. Uh, so I worked on thermoelectrics. So I worked on, they had been interested in doing a measurement on a device. They wanted to measure a device. And the idea was since it's thermoelectricity, heat and electricity are coupled. So the idea was, is there a way to only measure elect electrical measurements, like you only touch it with wires to do electrical measurements, but somehow back out all the thermal properties of the device through the coupling. So it was basically me sitting in the library and trying to derive a relationship mathematically. So I read the theory, I read a few books and tried to get got up on the theory. So I was modeling the device in MATLAB and also on paper to back count, like, so it's like, if you do the measurement in this way, if you oscillate the voltage, then you can back out, you can infer the thermal conductivity, you can infer the heat capacity. So I was trying to develop a model for how you would actually extract information from a very simple measurement. And information on the heat, temperature. On the, on, yeah, on the thermal properties, okay. you know, like, like um, how, how it behaves thermally. And in short, the conclusion was you couldn't really do it. You could you could get like two out of the three, but you couldn't get all three with only electrical measurements. I never really got any feedback. Like they never really told me you did a good job or anything. I just you know I just did what I could. I didn't I didn't know. I think later I I think the guy I was working with he's a professor now in Colorado um, named uh, Ron Gui. He was the grad student I was working with. I think he was kind of impressed with like just the level of depth and effort I put into it. And I think they did learn something. I mean, like, I don't think they were clear that they could even get two out of the three with just electrical measures. So I did derive something useful, but it was like, 
pages and pages and pages of math. <laughs> and does this does this process um, include you meeting with Gong Chen every now and then, or you, you don't Not even really. see him? I think I think I saw him maybe twice that summer. You know, he basically just worked with the grad student and. Okay. And then when it comes time for him to write a letter, he's going to talk to his grad student and that's going to inform the letter. Got it. Got it. Got so, it. So it's uh, very kind of hands off type of oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, but I kept Gong Chen is, he's from China. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's probably Gong Chen as a name is kind of like a super popular name. It's almost like John Doe or John Smith in the United okay. States. So I think he's probably the most popular Gong Chen in the world, like because he's an MIT professor. So. Okay. Is he still teaching? Yeah, he's still, I just, just, I just sent him a text like a couple hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're, we're colleagues now. Uh, he's okay. the one who recruited me back to MIT. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this, the story is so long. It's so interesting. So, um, so I did that. He wrote me a letter that got me in. He asked me what I want to do. I told him I'm interested in how atoms vibrate. And I told him, you know, like I, I felt like I had never gotten a straight answer on exactly what is temperature. Like the only answer I got is, yeah, well, it's related to the kinetic energy of the atoms. I'm like, but how? Like, show me the, like, the, like why this, this, this so critical parameter, why don't I ever see like an equal sign? Like, what is temperature equal to? I want to know what, what it's equal to. Right. And I never got a straight answer on that. Right. And that, that goes back to when you're 10 years old and you're part of this training group, right? every week and yep. asking the first principles questions yep and i couldn't let it go i right. was just like it because the other thing that was bothering him, like if it's related to the kinetic energy of the atoms why does it have its own units why not just make it energy like these things bothered me right. <laughs> you know so these are the kind of questions i was asking this was also a good match for an advisor because Gong was also, he was the type that was very receptive to that. He was like, fat. he would like, he would get fascinated with a student that was fascinated by that. He really enjoyed working with people that ask deep questions and have get into deep conversations mm -hmm. about stuff. So it was a good match for an advisor for me um, in that respect. So he goes, well, here's a book. It's something called Molecular Dynamics. I'm familiar with what it is, but I haven't done it before. So you can go learn and see if you can figure it out. <laughs> so I took the book, uh, took me a couple weeks and I was just so fascinated. So mm -hmm. apparently molecular dynamics was this approach where you could actually model how atoms were vibrating. You could actually, the same thing I had done with earthquakes and, and the floors of the building were moving. Mm -hmm. Now I could do the exact same thing and I could actually see how the atoms move. So my mom was like, yo, I want to, so I'm up all night. Like I want right. to write the pro, I want to write something that does. I really want to see how they move. So um, you what know. is it? What is it about vibration that just makes you so happy? What is it? It's the connection to music. It's the connection to music. It's like I know that certain frequencies induce certain feelings. Like they they have somehow all, all frequencies are not equal and they have different effects. Right. And so I was just so fascinated with like so everything around me is screaming frequencies, but I can't hear it. So right. what are they saying? What is right. it saying? Right. <laughs> And so it's fast, you know, if you fast forward like another six, four or five years, eventually I actually get the answer to this question. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Um, uh, so anyway, that was driving me. I think Gong was, was very impressed that I literally, all he did was hand me a book and I came back to him with results. Like I, I wrote my own code. I ran some simulations. I, I did an example problem. I'm ready to do more. And I think for him, that's like, that's like what an MIT student does. Like they, you give them a little bit and they run with it, mm -hmm. you know, and they take it somewhere. And so I think he, he never told me any of this stuff, but I later found, I think he was very impressed by that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he took me on a, on my first trip to a conference, my first summer. And I later, I didn't, a lot of this stuff was unbeknownst to me. I didn't know that that was a big, big deal. You know, later I found out that that was actually a really big deal for like to be a first year grad student going to a, to a conference, an international conference at that. And it's the premier conference in the field. And so I got to give a talk for five minutes in front of the who's who of the field. What was the conference? Uh, it's called the US Japan Seminar on Nanoscale Thermal Transport. That was the name uh, of the meeting. Nanoscale Thermal Transport, okay. Yep. And so at this time, 
using this technique that I had done to write this code called molecular dynamics, no one else in the field was really doing it at that time. It was, it was like kind of groundbreaking stuff. So it was like, so I showed some results. And that code, that code writing sprang from that, that time that you spent yep. doing code. Okay. Yep. That you had explained earlier. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so I showed some results, man, and like the who's who of the field, you know, were pulling me to the side afterwards, like, dad, is, I can't believe you just calculated that. Like, we've been trying to figure that out for years. And like, we've always wanted to know. And, and I don't know the whole context. So I'm just like, yeah, and then and it cool and it cool, you know. So the other thing that happened on that trip was, was so key. So I show up in Japan. Uh, um, I show up to the hotel. And there's actually another black dude there. And I'm like, what's up, man? <laughs> he was like, yo, what's good, man? <laughs> and and uh, I'm like, you here for this meeting? He's like, yeah, yeah, you here for this meeting too? Like, yeah, yeah. So it turns out he was a professor at Georgia Tech. His name was Sam Graham. And so he was surprised to see a black student at this meeting. Ain't a lot of, I mean, ain't a lot of people mm. in this field. There's, there's like nobody else in this field is black. Just me and Sam, basically, <laughs> mm. at this time, you know. And so that was exciting for him. And so he's like, you know, he asked me a few questions about career. And I was like, man, my dream would be to be a professor at Georgia Tech. He was like, really? We should keep in touch. <laughs> so mm. that planted the seed early that ultimately. So that was your dream to be a professor at Georgia Tech, not MIT? Yep. At that time, even though you're a grad student at MIT? Yep. Why is that? I had done the math, man. I was like, look, you know, I know I don't like it here at MIT. I'm not going to like Boston. I know that. I do want to be a professor at a top tier research institution, but I want to be in a city where there's black people. So you do, you do the math and it's like, all right, well, right. what are my options? Can't go from right. Berkeley, Stanford, <laughs> MIT, right. Georgia Tech, Atlanta. Right. Best of both worlds. Right. So I had done that calculation in my mind already. Like that's the ideal spot, you know. They rank like number five. Like that's that'd yeah. be dope if I could eventually get there, <laughs> you right. know. And so I planted that seed with him. He we kept in touch over the years. Over as I was doing my research, Sam played a absolutely instrumental role in me getting a job at Georgia Tech later. He was he was he was hyping me up to the faculty there before they had even met me. He was like letting them know like, yo, there's going to be this kid coming out of, coming out of Gong Chen's group. Cause Gong Chen is like, you know, like a very highly respected name. So it's like, right. it's going to be, a, you know, black kid coming out of his group, man, we right. should be paying attention. And then, right. you know, so by the time I came out, they were, they were ready, you know, they were interested in what I, what I had to say. Um, things got even more interesting there as well, because by the time I was about to graduate, um, and I remember Gong pulled me to the side and he was like, you know, I'm debating whether or not to encourage you to apply here. I to what, like, be a professor? At MIT. Okay. And I was like, what? This is after master's degree or PhD? I'm about to finish the PhD. I'm like six, six months to a year out. Because mm -hmm. he told me, he was like, man, you know, I was like, well, he was like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, well, I want to stick around because I got more stuff I want to learn. And he was like, well, honestly, you could graduate on what you've done already. <laughs> so. And how many well, years is this after, after was, um, you graduated from university, from FAMU? Coming up on five. So I was, in, I was at MIT for five years. So I did the master's in two and the PhD in three, which is on the shorter, on the shorter end. Probably about as short as people will allow it to be. <laughs> right. So unless you just did straight PhD, that that could be minimum like maybe four total. So anyway. Um, so he says he's debating whether or not to encourage me to apply for a faculty position at MIT. And for me, honestly, him saying that was the first time I actually thought realized that he actually thought highly of my work never like any like encouraging things like oh man that's awesome and then he just he poker face <laughs> the whole five what years. does that what does that mean to say he's debating what was what was he debating he's he was weighing whether or not i should be thinking about applying to mit which has a very a lot of interesting politics which is he's there 
So it's an advisor advising, like one of the students getting their PhD and immediately becoming a professor at, at the place is kind of- um, That's rare? Kind of. It's also kind of discouraged because they want people to go out and get other experiences and maybe uh, come back, uh, but not just like straight through and then you just become a professor. There are, it has happened in rare instances. I heard of um, one that was interesting where he was one of my professors, he taught uh, stat mech. Now this guy, I literally walked out of his class like that's the smartest human being I've ever encountered. <laughs> like this dude, this dude was on another level, man. Mm. He, I was in his class, man, and he was doing these derivations, no notes, eight boards of math, and he's doing it as, he's doing the math as he's doing it on the board. He's not, he didn't remember it. Mm -hmm. He gets all the way to the end of this problem, and he took a natural log in his head. <laughs> and he's like, natural log of this would be about two points, something, something, something. And then he goes, but that's not right. Something's wrong. Then he starts moving the boards around his side. Ah, minus sign. <laughs> minus sign. He goes back through the whole thing and <laughs> he forgot minus sign. And then he corrects his own thing in front of everybody, yo. This dude was on another level. Like, yeah, man. I was, it, was, it, was, it was the first time I had met someone where I was like truly intellectually intimidated. Like this, the, the, the way his brain was working, I could not fathom it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This I've is like, like, I was that, like, man. I'm not at that level. Like, I'm, yeah, you know. that's why I tell people, man, like, you know, in my life, people will tell me, you know, like, literally, they will say, I'm sure you've gotten this too. Like, you're the smartest person I've ever met, right? Mm -hmm. And I will say to them, well, then you haven't met a lot of people <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. I am not the smartest person. I mean, I remember even high school. Mm. I mean, I remember cats. Right. You know, I just found out the other day th this, she was a girl, you know, like she just won the Nobel Prize for um, astrophysics. Mm. I went to high school with her, you know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And Andrea Gaz. I think, uh, th was that this year? Yeah, she just won it. I think, I think I saw <laughs> yeah. a headline about that. Astrophysics. Yeah, yeah. What was it you know? for? Black hole, yeah, black holes, yeah. black hole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I... She was a year. She was a couple years older than me. Her wow. sister was a year above me. Then she was a couple years above her sister. Wow. So I remember her. Wow. And like she walked in the same high school as me, and wow. she just won wow. the Nobel Prize in wow. astrophysics. You know wow. what I mean? And and it's like there there's kids I know like. The smartest kid in our school in high school right now is a um, professor at Princeton. Actually, he's at Brandeis now. I just looked him up because I look these people up from time to time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I watched a lecture he did. I didn't understand anything, but he's a, he's, a, <laughs> he's a, no, I mean, he's a professor of string theory. Oh, wow. You know, in physics at, at Brandeis. He was at Princeton and then moved to, you know, Brandeis. I literally, like, almost shed a tear watching him because I remember him yeah. being, like, a kid that like a lot of kids didn't really talk to, you know what I mean? Like, right. and he grew up, his name is Matthew Hedrick, you know what I mean? And he, you know, he was seen as kind of weird because his parents didn't allow TV in the house. Mm -hmm. So he grew up without a television. And so he never mm -hmm. knew any of the movies kids were talking about, all the cool stuff kids were talking about. So he had this little group of nerd friends and all that, but like everyone knew and he won the Westinghouse Science Prize. Wow. Which is this prestigious thing when he was in high school. So he was in the newspapers and all of that. And mm -hmm. everyone knew he was like the smartest kid in the school. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And so every five or six years, ever since I've graduated, I will look him up to see what he's doing mm -hmm. because I'm interested to see what his life trajectory mm -hmm. has been. And he's a professor, you know, of string theory, you know what I'm saying? Physics, mm -hmm. that's deep. you know? So um, that's why when people tell me like, oh, you're so smart and I'm like, no, 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 no. You got to understand yeah. there's levels to this. There's thing. levels to this thing. <laughs> there's <laughs> levels to this thing. You know, there's levels to this thing. Yeah. Um, I, I feel you like when you see people um, show like a certain type of talent that almost is like unreal. Yeah, very humbling, and it actually 
it's quite emotional to see yeah. if you understand what it takes right. to do something like that. Right. I mean, like, so that actually the story with this guy, right, is he's a professor in physics. He's still there, professor in physics at, at MIT. And the story was he went, he, he did his PhD there. He went to do the qualifying exam. And the way that the format of the qualifying exam is you would be given three problems. Choose any of the three problems and solve it. You're allowed, you get the choice. You can choose whichever one, but you just got to mm -hmm. solve one of them. And he was the first person in the history of the exam that went and solved all three and got all three correct. And they gave him a job after it. Like he was, he was on the next level, yo. He did all three of the problems, yo. So three of them things. Three. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I think like he was saying things about the problem that was so insightful. They were just like, what? <laughs> So there's people like that. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, I, I was studying this guy. I forget his name, but um, you might know him. Was he? That might, no, he was in um, England, but is this Indian mathematician. Mm. He's very famous. He's the first uh, non-white person who be, who was accepted into the um, the British Academy of Sciences. Man, mm. I gotta I gotta remember his name. But they have a movie on him, mm. and. Um, it's fascinating, like his life story, like coming from a small village, like he just knew numbers, man. He just was able to just come up with numbers, like, and understand numbers, you know what I'm saying? So, so this, this became another piece of the pie for me, which was I started to realize or come to appreciate that autism is a very big spectrum. And I think that I was clear, became clear that part of the reason so many people at MIT are so weird is a lot of them are on the spectrum of autism. Like what part of what gives them their brain power is the lack of social skills. Like literally their brain has repurposed part of that machinery to give yeah. them extra power. Yeah. And they lack certain skills. Yeah, and some people have um, Asperger's too. Mm -hmm. Asperger's does that to a lot of people too, like outside of autism, like they lack social skills, but they have these high intellectual yeah. Powers. There's a guy, the, the Indian guy's name, just for people who will be watching this, um, his name is Ramanujan. Hmm. And they have, a, um, I think you'll find his story fascinating, man. Hmm. His name is Ramanujan. And um, they just call him Ramanujan. And, <laughs> one name, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, there's some Indians like that. They got one name. Yeah, yeah. No but, last you name. You know, that's just what they call him. Because, okay, oh, like a title? No, that's his last name, but they just call him his... His name is Srinivasa Ramanujan. Oh, okay. In that mathematics world, when you say the word Ramanujan, got it, got it's it. like you saying got Michael it. Jordan. Got it. Like got you're it, saying it. something big when you say his name. And it. he died like in his 30s, man. Oh, wow. Like he was a young guy and he came wow. there and just understood. No, like he used to dream about numbers yeah. and formulas and would solve these problems that. Like it was incredible. There's a movie about him, you know. That's well, I'm, 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 get, I'm getting him. to that. So that, so that, that actually. So when I was at MIT for for those years, very lonely, very uh, isolating experience, and there was a, a period where I kind of gave into the process. It became clear to me that I had been fighting letting this whole thing be part of my identity like i always like if you saw me at mit baggy jeans hoodie tims you know like i was i was repping hard because i wanted to i had to remind myself right right right, right. <laughs> and it took a while before i could i i i finally kind of got to this place where i was like like I would work hard and I would stop myself because I'm like, nah, I can't be doing this. Like it just can't just be all that I do. Right. And I would, I was holding myself back from just giving myself fully over to the work. And what was I remember, that about? you know, it was, the, it was an identity issue. Like it was a, it was a thing of like, I can't just be this. Like I can't, I can't be so into this that I'm like them, <laughs> you know, like I gotta be me. I'm well-rounded. I do other stuff. Were you like, were you scared you might lose some of your flavor? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, yeah. Oh yeah. And so I see you go, might start dancing off beat. Yeah. Start... <laughs> yeah. Because, because a part of, part of it is like, you know, I, I distinctly, I remember when I went the first month 
without touching another human being. Mm. And I start, and I was processing that. I was like, because, you know, I'm surrounded by weirdos. Right. Weird people. Nobody has the same sense of humor. Nobody listens to the same music. Like, right. it's very isolating. So you start questioning yourself, like, you know, it's, is this place affecting me? Have I started to become weird? So you, you know, weren't you you hanging out with cats at Chocolate City? They were undergrads. Okay. And so so okay. Okay. I would try sometimes, but I would tr I was more so trying to get with them on like a little bit of mentorship. But it was it was rare. I mean, I was always open and trying to find them, but we lived in different parts of campus and they right. was kind of doing their thing. Right, right. And they're undergrads too, so yeah, it's a whole it's different a, type of vibe. Yeah, it's yeah. a different vibe. So um but when I did see them, it was, you know, it was all good. And it was, uh, I was happy anytime they threw a, a event, right. I was there. Like they did, they used to do a comedy show and it was, okay. dumb, you know, so I would go there. But, um, but by and large, it was really a serious identity thing where I was wrestling with like giving myself over to really letting my mind do what it's capable of. Mm. And I remember, cause I used to have a room I had a roommate, like I had roommates all the time. I, I lived on campus the entire time. I had roommates. We, I never spoke to any of my roommates. Like we didn't talk. I didn't never see them. We just, I just go to my room. I got a bed and I had a board. I had a black, I had a marker board. And I used to fight it because I used to, I used to think like if I go up and start writing on my board, then I'm like doing some old beautiful mind type thing, like where I'm trying to be up at night, right? And I'm like, nah, I ain't finna do all that. <laughs> you know and eventually after some months man i just i just let it go man i was like you know right now i the, the problem is i'm i'm thinking about this stuff when i'm sleeping i'm i'm mm -hmm. the problems are that deeply ingrained in my brain and i wake up in the middle of the night and i have a thought and i start writing and i started mm -hmm. like you don't game. trip on it like just right. well, just let it be like right. that's what it takes to get out of here and and like some of my most innovative stuff, like I just started going very deep into theory and thinking like, you know, it was like almost like a little bit of a trance-like state. Mm -hmm. it yeah. Is where, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know, when you do math at that level where it was like you kind of, I would know the answer and I'm doing the math to prove it, to see if I can prove it. But it's like, I already know what this is about to say. I know what it needs to it's say. The, it's the muse, man. Yeah. It's the muse. <laughs> It's the muse, man. And look, that happens to people who are on the highest levels, you know, um, is being in cruise control and letting that muse take over. Whether you are a jazz musician, mm -hmm. you know, you can listen to people like Sonny Rollins talk about it. You know, they call it woodshedding, man. Right. I don't know if you, yeah, they call it woodshedding. And this cat used to woodshed for days, man. Right, right. Like, and so, especially when you meet, you know, like, these cats, they met Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. A lot of these cats had to go back into the woodshed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you, when you see certain type of talent in those types of spaces, it can be inspiring. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, um, it inspired me to go ahead and let go and just like yeah. go ahead and give into the process, give into it. And I definitely did my most innovative work in like that last year or so that I was at MIT because I just, I just started to let my creativity go. And it was like, I kind of know, I like, the, the thing is the intuition is connected. So it's like, I intuit and I know this is what is happening. So how, how can the math guide me to prove this? And so you start imagining things and imagining relations. What if I were to write this? What would that say? And how would this, might, you know, and you start, your mind starts to just go. Right. So for me, it was a good, exploratory experience where I started to realize like I was capable of that kind of thing. And so, so do you feel like when it comes to this, uh, this is probably gonna probably ask you something that some people haven't asked you before, but I understand it from a left brain, right brain approach. Do you feel like when it comes to the mathematics of this engineering that you're doing, did you, do you feel like you has somewhat of a psychic, spiritual relationship with it. Can Absolutely. You, yeah. Because that seems like that's what you were describing. Like, yeah. you knew yeah, what it was intuitively. You just need to now get into the rigmarole of getting and, to that. And point. this, and this 
for me, I'm glad you understand it because it's something that I have really never really been able to share with anyone. But this, this for me is what excites me about more black people getting into this because I know I'm not that deep, but that if more of our people get it, they will go, they will go to outer space. And I feel like that's what our people did 20,000 years ago. And that's what allowed us to make the pyramids. Like, like, if, because I often, you know, I go out, you look at the stars and you realize like, imagine the world with no TV. And our people literally sat for years and years and just watch, look, I mean, that's the entertainment. Look up, <laughs> look at the sky. And they start to appreciate like these, these little dots is moving around. <laughs> They're not in the same spot. Look at that. And they, they, they you know, and they start to actually engage with the, with the celestial mm -hmm. bodies. And you start to realize like, there's something about it that is kind of spiritual, like where, you know, when you have your first like dream of, of something mathematical and you wake up and it's like guiding you to something, you start to realize this isn't, this isn't just numbers. Like there's something about this. I, that like, nah, you know, Man, look, man, like this is so heavy. Cause I don't, you know, I don't really talk about spirituality or religion and stuff like that mm -hmm. because I believe that it's subject to anyone's imagination and first principles thinking is, is that it should be something that's not subjective. Mm -hmm. you know, if you ask people about spirituality, a thousand people will tell you a thousand different things, you know, mm -hmm. and it's mixed with mythology and all that. So I, I don't like to get into that, but what I can talk about experientially mm -hmm. is um, times in my life when I was involved with poetry very heavy and songwriting very heavy and you're sleeping and you hear songs in your head and you lose the song because you didn't record it while you were sleeping and you know you didn't have the discipline to really deal with the muse in the right way that the muse is there but you didn't have the discipline to do the rigorous steps mm -hmm. of recording it jotting it down working it out in other words you had it in you but you didn't do what was necessary to turn it into flesh Mm -hmm. Right. So I understand that intimately and I know what it means and I know what it means to have a feeling of electricity in your body when that is going <laughs> on. And you don't know when it's going to happen next. You don't know when that great idea is going to happen next, but you know what it feels like when your body is in tune with it. You feel the sweat in your hands. You feel right. the, it's that muse. You know, some people call it spirituality. Some people call it whatever they want to call it, but I'm familiar with it. So that's why when you start talking about these problems in your head and you're starting to dream about them and you know the conclusion, but now you got to work out the math. You almost have to reverse engineer your solution. Exactly. That's exactly what it is, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're talking about. But you know that excitement. It's not even excitement like a giddiness, but you know that almost kinetic or that electricity that goes in you rare, you don't get that feeling from other things, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a nice woman every now and then when you first meet her, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a, mm -hmm. a certain song when you hear it and it does something to you. Right. But you know, when that thing is inside you and that moment of greatness is there and we try to brain it and we try to cultivate it as much as we can and try to understand it. Mm -hmm. And you it seems like you had it with these problems and these numbers and you just decided, hey, forget about all this identity stuff going on. Like mm -hmm. this is something going on within me and perhaps that's who I am and who I've become. And so I just have to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And that was that was a that was a big step. Um, that was a big step. So once I kind of got to that place is when I was really so. So this, also <clears throat> what was interesting is. It wasn't until around this time that all the people I'd known culturally and in the community started to in any way associate me with, with technology and math and science. I was still just a drummer there, but it wasn't until I actually got to MIT and then it's like people started to realize like, you know, that brother go to MIT, right? Then, it's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> then it starts to like, I actually start to be known to people or people associate me yeah. with actually doing You were reinvented. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, things went from there. Long story short, I, uh, you know, Gong told me that thing about possibly applying to MIT. You know, I told him, I mean, you, you don't really got to 
debate it because I'm not a blind dude. Like, I, there's no way I'm staying here. <laughs> when I leave here, I am never coming back here. Mm. And he was like, why, why, why? And I'm like, you know, quite frankly, man, you're not black. Like, you can't understand what it's like to be here. Right. You know, and you feel isolated. Yeah. You know, he, he was a bit, I don't want to say upset with me, but he could not understand why I didn't want to go to Berkeley or Stanford. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to go to he didn't, he didn't feel like Georgia Tech was a great place. Nah, it's not at the same level. Same so level. there's MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley. That's considered the top tier. Then the Cal, second. Caltech isn't in there anymore? They're kind of right in between, you know, and then there's the um, second tier, which is Georgia Tech, Caltech, um, Michigan, University of Michigan. Does Harvard have an engineering school? They do, but they're not like top ranked. They're not, they're not top ranked. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he he felt like because I think it came out that I was I got an offer to go to Berkeley, and he thought I was crazy not to accept an offer to go to Berkeley. I was like, Nah, man. I mean, it's a balance between work and life, and right. for me, Atlanta's where it's at. And so anyway, I went to Atlanta, um, started a family. Um, so you started working at Georgia Tech. Yeah. There's actually like professor. three years I just skipped in between there because <laughs> okay. I went to I went to do some postdocs. So I got oh, so way it went down was I actually got the job I got the job offer to go to Georgia Tech. I signed the job offer. And is this I, related to the brother you met? It did totally related. Okay. He, he he arranged all this. I got the offer. Offer was great. Signed the offer, but did not set my start date. So I actually postponed my start date instead of starting like I, let's say I finished spring graduated normally people would start start in the fall i asked if i could instead do a postdoc and postpone when i started i wanted to go learn more stuff so mm -hmm. i did a postdoc went to oak ridge national lab stayed there for a year um, we did what we did skip is what was your phd thesis uh it was about phonon transport in uh, polymers and there's something special case in point talking about vibration mm -hmm. there is something special about how a polymer chain can vibrate okay that so actually, for people who aren't familiar with phonons and what a polymer is yeah, yeah let's yeah. just break it down as simple as yeah. we can so um polymers are uh, a, a class of molecules typically are carbon based they have some carbon backbone they tend to form chains, like the atoms are struck, like many, many materials are structured where their the atoms are arranged in three dimensional crystals. Polymers tend to arrange in individual chains, like linear strings. These strings can be in different forms. They can be all entangled together like spaghetti. Um, and polymers are generally like your plastics, epoxies, things like that. Those are generally like hydrocarbon chains that are very long. Hydrocarbon chains are also like oil. These things are all derived from oil. So they're, you know, um, mostly carbon and hydrogen or they have, tend to have a lot of carbon and hydrogen in them. Mm -hmm. Other elements mixing in can make them be different things like glue or Elmer's glue mm -hmm. because these, you know, these are all various types of polymers. Mm -hmm. I was studying uh, this polymer, which is probably polyethylene, like this straw, you can't see it, this, you know, like a straw. This is polyethylene. This is the com most common type of plastic. Mm -hmm. And so the molecules inside this thing are a bunch of individual st string looking molecules, but they're all entangled together. Mm -hmm. And what I was studying was the thermal conductivity, which is essentially how well it can conduct heat. Now heat is interrelated with these vibrations. So I'd been gotten really deep in studying that. And so what we hypothesized was that if you took a polymer chain and it's like, you know, entangled. Now, if you pull on it and you stretch them out and you actually get them to align in straight lines, that the properties of the chain would change. Like you'd, you'd actually be much better at conducting vibrations along the chain if you could get the chains to be straight. Mm -hmm. So I was doing simulations that showed this, that this was true, but it actually went a step further, which was like a bit of a discovery that we didn't expect. And it turned out that the thermal connectivity could become infinite. So, which is, which basically means you can make a thermal superconductor. And it has to do with specifically with the way these molecules can vibrate. And because it's a one dimensional string of, of atoms, 
um, there's some special physics that happens. And so I was like doing all kinds of theory and deriving and, and, and explaining. And what is a phonon? Oh, sorry, a phonon is, um, this gets a little bit into quantum mechanics. Um, the easier way to think of it is that you have these various types of vibrations that can exist in a group of atoms. They exist at different frequencies. There are different ways that the atoms move in these different frequencies. Each of those is what we call a normal mode. And a phonon is a quanta, like a little unit of energy in a, in a mode. And so the name comes from the analogy to photon. And mm -hmm. so a photon is a integer unit of excitation in the electromagnetic field. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's light, but it's basically a unit of light. So it turns out that if you solve the electromagnetic field according to quantum mechanics, the electromagnetic field does not change in a continuous manner. It actually changes and jumps, has integer steps that oh, it can take. Okay. And so that's, you know, what happens because of quantum mechanics. It turns out that the math that describes photons is almost identical to the math that describes atomic vibration. So those same integer steps exist for, uh, for atomic vibrations. Like they can mm -hmm. be in one mode and then that mode can have one amplitude or the next step, but nothing mm -hmm. in between. Interesting. And so that's uh, integer jump of energy is called a phonon. Got so it. Got I it. study phonon transport, which basically just means I study how atoms vibrate. Right. And so um, <clears throat> turns out that polymer chains can do something very special, which we ended up getting a big paper out of it because it was kind of a shock because nobody thought there's some other theory that says that that's impossible, but it turns out that it actually is possible in that special case of a polymer chain. Okay. So, so polymer, polymer chains is the only known um, situation in which you can actually have that type of a, a, a jump. Yeah. Uh, that kind of where you can have the thermal conductivity, what we call divergent actually goes to infinity. Okay, but it can go to infinity. Okay. Yeah, it, it basically means if you were to, if you could take a polymer, a single polymer chain, mm. heat it on one end, have try to have this side at one temperature, and this side at a little bit lower temperature, it essentially says an infinite amount of energy could flow through that chain. Like the the rate at which energy is flowing through would become infinite. Interesting. And so that generally is not possible, but and that at least theoretically it is <clears throat> in the in that case. So I was proving it, showing how it happens, why it happens, and that was all like my new theory that I was adding to the game. Okay. Um, so that was like my bread and butter. Um, I went from there to Oak Ridge, did a year at Oak Ridge, then went to Northwestern, did another year of postdoc at Northwestern. In Chicago. Yep. <clears throat> and then I kept so I kept calling the chair of the department at Georgia Tech like. Yo, I want to keep learning. So can I go can I have another year to do this? And so I pushed back my start date for like three years. Mm. And so the third experience was I went to the Department of Energy. And so that's I, where that research yeah, came that's, out that I, that I had read about with the. Um, right. So that's when I got into solar thermal. Yep. That's where I got into concentrated solar power. That's where I got into high temperature heat transfer. I, I really got into a whole my whole scope of what I do broadened dramatically when I went to the Department of Energy. Okay, so before you went to the Department of Energy and you're studying phonons and you're dealing with Gong Chen and you're dealing with um, Mercola, mm -hmm. are you in the back of your mind thinking about solving the human problem of- I was, yeah, I mean, I had warming? always- Yeah, I always wanted to do something in that regard. I'd done my PhD, which kind of took me to science and physics and none of that really applied to global warming so when I got the chance to go to the DOE that was what was driving me it's like this was my chance I was like oh wow I got a chance to actually get to the stuff I really care about got and it. so um, I ended up bringing all of that knowledge and experience that I had had on this like fundamental physics side now forward to applications like do something useful because <laughs> none of that stuff is like all that useful <laughs> it's just it's just science it's like fun and interesting science right. but um, now I was getting into stuff that I was really, pra was really practical and was fascinating as, as well. Right, you've gone from theoretical science to applied science now. Right. So, um, so in short, what grew out of me doing that time at the Department of Energy was that I, um, I started questioning 
you know, if we could do things at higher and higher temperatures. So for me, as this person who does simulations, temperature, now I knew what temperature was. And uh, temperature was like this lever. And I'm like, well, why do we have to keep stopping? Like, why do why not turn temperature up super duper hot? Like, and it turns out it's just practical limitations. People are used to using steel to make an infrastructure and steel will melt or get soft. And so then I started saying, well, why we got to use steel? Right. Let's use something else. And that kind of thinking was very uh, radical, I'll say. People thought I was kind of crazy for thinking of using stuff other than steel. <laughs> and um, that ultimately is what led me towards doing, building devices that operate at extremely high temperatures using you know, non-traditional materials and showing what, that it can work. What is the benefit of using, uh, yes, something at a high temperature? temperature there must be yeah. some reason for that, right? Uh, yeah, um, there's a, there's a very good reason. Um, I'm trying to think of how to explain it without going too far off the deep end, but it ultimately comes down to a property called entropy. And so, um, you can kind of think of heat, like you think of electricity, you could have a certain amount of energy as electricity and there are two aspects to that energy. There is the voltage at which you have that electricity, and then there's the current. Those two things are rather distinctly different things, but they both play a role. So you could have a tremendous voltage and a tiny current, and it's actually not a lot of energy. Or you could, you could have- for the, for the people listening, uh, the difference between voltage and current, like in a real world? It's- like um, it, so, so you can think of it just the, you can think of it as the product. So that the product of the voltage and the current is what gives you like how much power you actually have. So, um, a great, well, where I'm, where I'm going with this is that energy and voltage is two different things. So you can think of okay, let's think. Let me make it. I gotta explain what voltage is. So, so imagine you have a pipe. Mm -hmm. And you want to flow. Well, it was explained to me, so yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Imagine you got a pipe. You want to flow water mm -hmm. through the pipe. Um, how fast the water will move through the pipe depends on how much pressure you're pushing the water with. Mm -hmm. The voltage is like the pressure, mm -hmm. okay? And that's how much force is pushing the electrons through the wire. Mm -hmm. Now, if you make a wire extremely thin <clears throat> and it has a lot of resistance not much electricity will go through it, despite the fact that you might have some ginormous voltage across it. You could put a lot of pressure on water going through a minuscule pipe and it may not flow very fast because the pipe presents a lot of resistance, so not mm -hmm. that much flow. So there's an interrelationship between how hard you push, what it's flowing through and how, how much actually goes through. Mm -hmm. So voltage is like that. Mm -hmm. And what would, current, what would current represent? Current is the rate at which the water is going through. It's, this, it's like the, the, the number of gallons per, per minute of water that are going through is what's like what we call the current. It's the number of electrons that are flowing through the wire per unit time. There is a similar analogy you can make with heat. Okay. So heat, temperature is like voltage. Heat flow is like current. So you can have the same amount of energy and what temperature you have that energy affects something called entropy and it it affects how you, what you can do with the energy so what you can do with it is determined by the entropy and it turns out that the hotter the heat is the higher the temperature that any unit you can have the exact same amount of energy at different temperatures if you push the temperature up the energy becomes more useful you can actually do more with it you can convert more of it to electricity <clears throat> And so this, this is a outgrowth of something called the second law of thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could, I mean, it probably wouldn't take too, too long, but it would probably be like a half hour. I could explain how all that works, but suffice it to say that temperature is a separate issue than energy. You can have a certain amount of energy and it can be at different temperatures. So those are two different things. And so the question is, if you're going to have one unit of energy, <clears throat> what temperature do you have it at? Is it, you can have you can have a unit of energy very close to room temperature. 
It's just a little bit above room temperature. And you can have a crap, you can have a lot of energy just above room temperature. Or you can have a lot of energy and it'd be very high temperature. Mm -hmm. But temperature is key. So the hotter it is, the more you can do with it. So that's the reason we want to go hot. Um, chemical reactions become accelerated at higher temperatures. How much energy, how much heat you can convert to electricity increases with temperature. A lot of things get better if you go hotter. Problem is we went into some practical limitations. We physically can't make something hotter. Because the materials. Cause, cause the, what you're going to use to hold it will melt. <clears throat> and so there are classes of materials that you can use that can survive extremely hot. The problem is they're not like metal, so you can't weld them. You can't make connections between two pipes and build a pump and all this stuff. So that's what we invented is the ability to take these other kinds of materials called ceramics and, and things that are brittle, they snap easy, but they have this special property. They can stay solid, extremely hot. And so we basically started um, working on that for a few years. We managed to make some progress on that. And so we developed high temperature seals and things that now- yeah, At the end of the day, you're looking for a, uh, a, a methodology to have energy. Yeah. Right. And I think what, what would happen was confusing a lot of people is a lot of people equate electricity with energy. Right. 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 And you're not dealing with the electricity. You're dealing with the end product of electricity to be energy where you can get to energy through heat. Yes. Right. There are, there are, there are a great, there are a number of forms of energy. Right. They're all, they are not the same, but they are interchangeable in the sense that you can convert between them. And so you can convert electricity to heat, just like you do in a little space heater. You mm -hmm. put in electricity, the wire heats up and you get the heat out. Um, thermoelectrics is a, an approach to go the opposite way. You put in heat and electricity comes out. Um, you can convert heat to mechanical energy. Like actually you can push something with heat. You can put gas in a piston mm -hmm. cylinder and heat it up and the piston's gonna, the gas is gonna expand, it'll move the piston. You can, so you can convert between different is, forms of energy. <clears throat> is vibration a byproduct of heat or is heat oh, yeah. a by, it, byproduct it, of vibration? They are the same thing. It is, that, is, that is heat. That's what I so, thought. So, the, so, so when, something, when something heats up, you, get, you can calculate the kinetic energy of the atoms one half MV squared on average. As you heat it up, one half MV squared is increasing. So if you double the temperature, you just doubled the kinetic energy of the atoms. It's very proportional. So, um, so anyway, that's, uh, we started getting into doing stuff at really high temperatures that. Um, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. Kinetic energy causes heat. It is heat. It is heat. Yeah. So like, so like, say, this, let me say it this way. Let's say you have a group of 10 atoms. They each have one half MV squared. They're, they're all moving. So at a given instant, you could freeze time, measure their velocity. One half times the mass of each atom times the velocity squared will give you the kinetic energy of that atom at that instant. Add it up so, for all, all 10 atoms. That's now the total energy, total kinetic energy of all those atoms. So when we're talking about heat, we're not talking about heat as a byproduct of kinetic energy, we're saying that kinetic energy is actually heat. It is, yes. Okay, because a lot of people think about, you know, like this. Yeah, that's friction. <laughs> right. Yep. So that movement of the friction there is heat. Yep. Right, but there's kinetic energy, but you're saying that that kinetic energy is actually the heat. Yes, yes. So, Got it. so you are taking your macroscopic kinetic energy when you do this microscopically the atoms are being pushed against each other and so you are converting some of your macroscopic energy into microscopic kinetic energy the atoms actually start moving faster because you're rubbing your hands and that increase in kinetic energy is what registers to us as temp that's an increase in temperature got it got it that was very helpful yeah yeah so so um the other thing so that was your question actually what is when you said what is temperature right got it right well, there's an, it, gets, it gets deeper, it gets even deeper, which is the atoms are moving and they have lots of frequencies they're moving at simultaneously. They're all, it, if you look at a video of it, it just looks like random vibrations, it's not random. And so 
those frequencies are generally up in the terahertz regime. So, so one with 12 zeros behind it. That's how many hertz. Like that's way beyond what human beings can hear. But those vibrations span a whole spectrum and that spectrum goes all the way down to zero frequency. So there are, there's a small number of those frequencies that actually we can hear. Those frequencies, that's sound. That's what we hear as sound. It. It's actually atoms vibrating at slow enough frequencies that we can actually hear it, but it is, the, it is literally the same thing. So heat transfer is like sound transfer. It's like one and the same. Interesting. Yep. Very interesting. So, so, so you, so you work at the department of energy. Yep. And then, so tell me about this, the, the solar heat project that you did and yes, how it so, came to fruition in terms of real world application. So when I was at the department of energy, I got a chance. It was just it was so cool to be working there at that time. I got a chance to go around the world and see all the power plants that had been made like this. So I got to tour them learn what the issues are, how they work. I saw a particular opportunity, which is these plants could be a lot more efficient if they could operate at a higher temperature because of this issue of how much electricity they can make from the heat they capture from the sun. It is a function of how hot the heat is that they capture. And so if they can turn the temperature up, it can get, the efficiency can go up and the cost comes down. And so I was- The very, only limitation is the materials. Yeah. So I got interested in figuring out how we can push the temperature up so we can get the cost lower. So when I got to Georgia Tech, I started writing proposals on that and ended up getting some money to try it out. Long story short, things worked out well. It worked, so we, you know, we managed to demonstrate the highest temperature pump on record. And then um, that got us a lot of notoriety. And then Gong Chen, I saw him at a conference <laughs> and he's like, so let's, He's like, you headed back to the airport? I was like, yeah. He's like, let's share a cab. He's like, uh, so, you know, I know you got your, your, your high temperature heat transfer stuff going on. You got the phone on stuff going on. He's like, is it, is there any, is there any universe where you might come back to MIT? And I was like, you're bugging, man. No, oh, man, I'm happy at Georgia Tech, man. <laughs> I was like, I'm happy. But, Wait, hold uh, on. So when you're at DOE, no, this is years later now. I'm okay, done. this is years later. Yeah, I moved to Georgia. You're at a con. This yep. you're at a conference. Yeah, I'm at a conference. I've been at Georgia Tech for a few years. And oh, okay, and, and you're I'm talking about some of the work you did at DOE at this conference, or you're just at the no, conference? no, no. D DOE is really just was the gateway for me to start thinking and learning about this stuff. I got Once it. Once I got to Georgia Tech, I started doing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, it was my so first there, but there was a project that you wrote about. Um, that had to do with solar thermal right. energy. Yeah. Right. Was that a DOE or that was at Georgia Tech? That was at Georgia Tech. Okay. I, I learned, I got my my primer on how all that technology worked at DOE. So that's what got me interested in doing it and feeling like I knew what the issues were. Got it. So you yeah. get to Georgia Tech and you build on that. Yep. And so it culminates in a in a project that exists somewhere. No, no, no. I, we never built any solar power plant. We oh, were trying okay. to invent a new infrastructure so someone could make a higher temperature version of the technology. I had aspirations of commercializing that, but eventually moved on because it became clear that that technology is not likely to be like a major player in the, in the final energy system. Not in my, in my view. Why not? Uh, this, is, a, this is more like, this was this just more in depth uh, it, the answer the answer's rather simple from my perspective. I actually just hosted a, um, there's actually a whole one hour um, panel on exactly this question <laughs> that I just hosted for a, uh, there's an international colloquium series that um, I co-chair called Innotherm, MIT Innotherm. If people look that up, there is a um, session we just did called the future of CSP. CSP stands for concentrated solar power. Mm -hmm. And so I gathered together some of the world experts to answer this question of like, what is CSP gonna look like in the future? And so the issue is the following. Um, concentrated solar power works by having mirrors that reflect light up to a tower or whatever, and, and, and then something gets hot. Is that the same thing as the Fresnel lens? Kind of, yeah. Okay. The problem is that there are two parts of, of the light that is coming from the sun. 
the light is coming and it's straight, but then it gets scattered by clouds and there's a portion of the light that becomes what we call diffuse. I mean, it starts going in all kinds of different directions. Some of the light still keeps coming in straight. That's what we call direct normal incidence. So there are maps that people have made to measure the direct normal incidence on the entire globe. And the only places where concentrated solar power makes economic sense is where the direct normal incidence is very high. Right. Because that's the only portion of the light that will reflect at the right angle to get up to the tower. Right. If it's diffuse and it's going all kind of random angles, it doesn't end up where you want it. It just goes everywhere else. Right, it's not efficient. So photovoltaics, PV cells that sit out in the sun, they can make use of both the direct and the diffuse light. They can capture both because you're capturing it right where it's hitting the panel. But if you're ref requiring a reflection to go in a certain direction, only the direct part actually goes there. So you lose about 20, 25% of the light to the losing the diffuse light. And when you look at the map of where the, the direct normal incidence is high, it's kind of a hard sell that you will be able to power the majority of the world Got with it. the pockets of locations where the DNI is really nice and big and bright. Now, there are, there's plenty of space that does it, like especially the Sahara and Australia and things like that. But the problem is these are not locations where people live. So now you've got to capture the energy in one location and, and you got a transmission a, problem. Now you got to transmit it thousands of miles of where people are living. So it just makes the overall proposition a lot, lot, lot more expensive. Right. So I haven't abandoned it, but I stopped working on it as, as, as significantly because, because of that, but it wasn't stopped really. We, we just pivoted. And so what became the clearer path to go down is to instead utilize one of the key aspects of those those plants which is they store heat and it turns out storing heat is extremely cheap and so what it makes sense to do what we're pursuing now i mean i write proposals on this now i'm developing a technology that does this now is you take electricity from solar panels and wind and you just make a battery and so now you make a heat battery instead of storing it electrochemically the way you normally do in a, in a like a lithium ion battery Instead, we can make something like 10 to 100 times cheaper where you store the energy as heat instead. And so it's dirt cheap. That's what's beautiful about it is you can actually store massive amounts of energy very cheaply. As heat. As heat. So you so, take so, your electricity, I mean, yeah. you run a heater, just like your space heater. But now remember, temperature is this variable. You can shift it up. So we shift the temperature that the heat comes out at extremely high so high it's like a light bulb it's like an incandescent what material would be able to hold it so we use um well that was we've got some papers on this we use graphite that's one of the main materials we use so so graphite can tolerate high levels of heat yeah well ha high temperature high temperatures Tem of heat specifically yeah graphite does not decompose until 3000 degrees and just put, put that in perspective um the sun is at 5,000 degrees C. Okay. Steel melts at 1,500 degrees C. Okay. So carbon can stay solid way hotter than steel can stay liquid, stay solid. Got it. Got it. Carbon is also extremely abundant. That's why it's cheap. Right. So graphite can do it. Uh, does graphene play a role in this? Graphite is just a bunch of layers of graphene stacked together to make stacked it together, solid. right? Yeah, graphene is just if you were to shave off like one layer of atoms. Right, that's just the nano form yeah. of graphite, right? Yep. Okay, so this heat, I'm trying to imagine this. So this heat is stored yep. in a box of graphite, yep. let's just say, right? I'm just trying to visualize this. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you an image, I'll show you a picture. You get the picture. Happen to be working on something like this a few minutes before we were talking. Oh, uh, can you enable screen sharing? Yes. Let me see. Should be probably a little triangle button near the screen, the share screen button. It should be. Yeah, it says one participant can share at a time, multiple part. Advanced share option. Advanced sharing. Yeah, hit advanced sharing. Oh, okay, hit. all participants. Okay. Yep. There it goes. All right. So you can see my screen? Yep. So this is this box of graphite here. 
Okay. So you take in electricity from wherever. It could be PV, wind, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Powers this heater, which heats up to an extremely high temperature, which is basically like a giant light bulb filament. It's glowing white hot. We developed this pump, which now we pump liquid metal, which happens to be tin, which is like solder. It's a special material. We just get lucky in nature. It turns out solder melts at an extremely low temperature, like 200 degrees C, but doesn't boil until 2600 degrees C. So it can stay liquid for an extremely big temperature range. So um, we pump the liquid through the graphite pipes, another fortuitous thing of nature. Carbon and tin do not form any chemical compounds. So there's no corrosion. Oh. So, so these two can sit in contact with each other without forming anything. They just It's a beautiful system. It's mm -hmm. corrosion free. So when you're doing these types of outlays for the real world, do you have to work with material scientists as well? Well, that was, that was what I would say is the unconventionalness of my approach is that I, I saw that as a significant fault to many new technologies as people have to go invent new materials. And instead, I decided let's make ours out of all existing materials. And the hard part is for us to figure out how to make them work together. So all this graphite, this is all commercially sold. We don't, we don't actually make any new materials whatsoever. Oh, no okay. new materials. Um, so all this is commercially so we just buy from vendors. We have vendors that can machine and we have our own machining facilities to make it ourselves. But this pump pumps the liquid tin through the graphite as it goes through this tube, this tube surrounded by a heater. The liquid heats up, comes out hotter than it went in, mm -hmm. carries it over to the big giant blocks of graphite. Mm -hmm. To give you a sense, this thing is like a football field long. Okay. And and like a football field wide or so. This is ginormous. These are mm -hmm. huge, huge blocks of graphite. Pipes of graphite are going through it, carrying the liquid. And so the liquid goes through. It's also glowing white hot. And so it heats up the blocks. And so it goes through here and comes back and fetches energy and brings it and heats up the blocks to the peak, to peak temperature. So that's how you're converting electricity to heat in a giant storage unit. Okay, got it. And then when you want electricity back later, mm -hmm. you use your pump, pump the liquid through these blocks. Mm -hmm. it, the liquid comes out as hot as the blocks are. Then you take it over here. And this is what we're using. What you would normally do is use a turbine to do conversion of heat to electricity. That's how it's usually done. Okay. What we do here is something very different. You mean like how they, they would take a steam turbine? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Steam turbine efficiency is about 30 to 40%. Okay. So that means we would lose like 60% of the energy doing that conversion. Yeah. Energy. But that's what, that's how it's normally done. Um, instead, what we're trying to do is get to a higher efficiency and there's some other important benefits. We don't use a turbine. Instead, we use photovoltaics. We actually use PV. So because this entire infrastructure is glowing white hot, we actually just convert some of the light coming off of the piping. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. So these PV cells are not normal. <laughs> these PV cells have mirrors on the back. So the majority of the light that's hitting them is actually not the light we want to convert. We just want the upper 30% or so of the spectrum, the very high frequency light, mm -hmm. that can be converted efficiently. The, the rest, we let it go through the cell, hits this back reflector, this mirror. It's a silver mirror on the back. It reflects back out and goes back to the hot pipes and they reabsorb it so we preserve all the energy we don't use. This is how we get to high efficiency. We don't even try to convert most of the light. We just convert the only the light we can convert very efficiently. So the benefit of this is really in cost. So these PV cells are way cheaper than a, than a turbine. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the ramp rate. So if, as it's designed, these pipes are carrying the liquid. It's kind of shown floating here, but we, you know, you'd attach this to an actuator. Remember, an actuator. Mm -hmm. and you can actually insert the PV in the light source or pull it out, kind of like a fuel rod at a nuclear plant. And so, what this allows us to do is control the rate at which we're discharging the electricity. And so, if we pull the PV out, we get zero output. We stick them in, we get more output. And so, the reason this is important is because one of the key problems with using a turbine to do energy storage like this is the time it takes to ramp from zero output to full output. Mm -hmm. For a turbine, that's like an hour. But with this, we can do it in seconds. And if you look at, you know, when you talk to people that operate the grid, this is the kind of thing they've been dreaming of. It's something where they can output 
gigawatts of power in seconds. Right, right, right. So that would be the storage mechanism there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially, this is your battery. Yep, this is the battery. Okay, and this would be all at the centralized power plant level, right? Yeah, this you could put wherever. You could put this next to a PV plant, a PV field, a wind field. You put this wherever. It's geographically not limited or constrained. Interesting. And it's pretty agnostic. It can take in power from wherever. Right. That's what I'm seeing from here. So you would have the PV here. And the PV serves to heat this up. Uh, which one? This one? Yeah, here. Yeah, uh, you, c you can use the annotate that you can point on the screen if you want. If you're talking about this one, this uh -huh. PV is providing electricity that there's like an excess of electricity during the day. You can't uh -huh. use it, so now you want to store it in this battery. So it, right. it feeds its electricity into this plug and runs these heaters. Right. So the heaters, they heat up the liquid. Yep. The hot liquid is stored in here. Yep. It, it heats up these blocks. Heats up the blocks. Yep. Okay. And then right here, what happens? The liquid goes into here? Uh, I can't see your cursor. Can you, if you hit annotate, you can uh, draw on the screen. I'll be able to see it. Oh, okay. I don't know. And just the thing on the, to the right that says multi junction. Oh, this. Okay. Yes. yes. This thing? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. That is, that is the other PV cells that are used to convert the light back to heat, back to electricity. That's converting the heat back to electricity. Okay. That's we call it multi-junction because it actually, it's more than one PV cell actually. It's multiple junctions of PV inside. I see. That, that's what helps make it efficient. Okay. And that's the part where it converts into electricity. Yep. And that's, is that what you said is that? So then the MPV module is taking the bright light yep. and converting that into electricity? Yep, and in doing so, it causes the liquid to cool down because some of its energy that left didn't come back. Got it. So those are PV cells of the multi-junction okay, photovoltaic. Those are PV cells that are orange and, and white at the bottom. Um, let me yeah, let me clarify. So this is the this is the PV cell. Uh huh. With the mirror on it back. Yeah, on the back I see this, it. This right. That is, this thing you're seeing here is this. It's being inserted oh, into got it, got it, got this, it. this little unit cell of pipes. These pipes are what's carrying the liquid. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So it's the pipes that are red and, red and, red and white. It's the pipes that are red and white. Got yeah. it. Okay, they're carrying the liquid. Yeah, I didn't understand that part. Yeah, the PV stays cold. So the got PV it. is actively cooled with water to keep it cold. Okay, so all those other pieces to the right of the multi-junction are just the inside pieces there. Yeah, yeah, this Got is, it. This, Got is it. this thing down here is this cut in half. So you can see Got it. here Got and then you see it. the PV. Got it. So, yeah. so what it is really is the, um, the graphite and that multi-junction, that's the whole system. That's the power discharge portion of the system, yeah. Got it. That's the that's the that's what takes the place of the turbine. Got it. Understood. Okay, so where are you at with this now? Uh, we're building it in my lab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that must be exciting, man. It is. It is. We, um, you know, it's it's. So I didn't I didn't talk about the temperatures. <laughs> so it, you know, the temperatures are so hot that it's right. It's that's the next question I was going to ask is how how can it be managed by human beings so it's it's surrounded by a lot of insulation <laughs> um you know big blocks of insulation that are you know a foot and a half thick um it's quite a magnificent sight to see i'll, I'll just say that i mean once it heats up that's that's where it got this moniker um there's some there were some news articles about it where we started calling it uh, sun in a box you see here Okay, got uh, it. Because it's like the sun trapped inside of a box. <laughs> um, because it's so hot, 
it's I mean it's hard to it's hard to for people to imagine it. It's it's about the same temperature as a light bulb filament. So imagine a but the, if you think about it, that light bulb filament is like <laughs> it's like a less than a millimeter thick. Right. Now imagine you know a, a light bulb filament the size of a football field, right? Like right. it's so huge and it's so hot the amount of light coming off of it is, is kind of hard to imagine. Um, when we run our experiments, you can't look at it. It's too bright to look at. Like, it, like, you f like if you're looking at it, then that means the light can reach your eye. So like you feel hot looking at it, right. <laughs> like, right. you know? But well, let's talk about the implications. So the, the main implication here is that it's cheap. This is, this is low cost energy storage and it can be high efficiency or high enough efficiency. But it's not portable. Mm, I, I don't know. Um, I'm saying it can only be used as a through centralized systems. In other words, it can't be used as a car battery. No, no, right. Right, that's what I mean. It can't be right. used as a car battery, can't be used as a home battery. No, no, this is definitely- So it's a centralized system, right? So yep. it would be basically utility scale. Absolutely, yes. Got it, got it, got it. Yep, yep. And that's the that's the hard problem to solve, is the utility scale problem. You know, you can for smaller scales you can get away with lithium ion, but the cost doesn't scale well when you go bigger. For lithium ion. Yeah. So then your your system can be a solution. Yep. So lith lithium ion costs are now at about somewhere. It's difficult to know what numbers to believe, but say somewhere between two hundred and maybe three hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Oh and no, no, no! Tesla's gotten it down. You, how, you didn't what, see their what, what, you didn't see their battery you, day. You got to well, see their battery day. They well, have a battery day. A couple. Um, what number? What number are they quoting now? And is it the whole package or just the cell? Oh, the whole package. It's um. It's under a hundred dollars per kilowatt hour now because the whole they're, big, they're, they're the big thing. Less than hundred. Yeah, they've had some pretty big breakthroughs, man. Um, I'll send right. you. I'll, nope, I'll no send you. I'll, I'd like to hear your comments. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I hear different numbers every day. No, I know you. Some do. people, some people, nobody knows what to believe with no, these no, numbers. I, I, I know you do. That's why hearing your commentary will actually so, be very valuable for me because. So, so um, the lowest, the lowest numbers I've heard. Uh, that they, they that they can get down to fifty, with with recycling batteries. Yeah, That's yeah. The lowest I've heard. Yeah. So with with this technology, we we expect to get to ten. Okay, that is better than what they're saying. So what they did is they changed some of the manufacturing process. They changed some of the materials using um, nickel and some cathode and some anode mm -hmm. type stuff that they got going on. They explained yeah. it pretty well in their battery day. Um, that was a couple of weeks ago. I'll send you the video for you to look at because I would love to hear. It's your, exciting. Yeah, I'd love it's to hear your commentary. Because I'd I love mean, to we, hear your commentary. We still need lithium ion to solve the transportation problem. Yeah, and I think also, you see, where I'm at with the whole renewable energy thing is I, um, okay, so let me just backtrack a little bit. So, uh, coming from Ghana, when I was a child, uh, we used to call my grandmother from Chicago because I grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, when you would call back home in the 80s and the 90s, uh, you would call to you know, speak to the person that you're trying to speak to and it would take about 15 minutes to 20 minutes for that person to come to the phone because there was only one telephone in the neighborhood block. Mm -hmm. So usually you'd have a little kid run errand to go, you know, call the person, the person walks up, you might speak to them for two minutes, mm -hmm. you know, but you were on the phone for half an hour waiting for the person, you know, and that was the time when uh, the phone bills were very high to make international calls. Yeah. yeah. And that was because there was a lack of infrastructural development due to colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward, um, I go to Ghana as an adult in 2005, 2006, and everyone has a cell phone. And even like the bum on the street begging you for money has a cell phone, right? And that was because there was no longer any capital expenditure needed
for a distribution system for the wires. Mm -hmm. You have a satellite, or you would have the tower, the which tower. is a satellite. Then you know you have the receiver, right, which is the yeah. phone. Mm -hmm. Well, electricity is the same way, the sun being the tower, right? And so my, my thinking was always that you never, part of the problems in Africa with electricity is not electricity generation, but electricity distribution. distribution. Mm -hmm. So, because they're not going to spend all that money to wire yep. everyone's house. They just don't have it. Yep. So just like what happened with the phone, I saw many years ago that the, the solar, you know, the panels can be the receiver, just like the phone using the sun. And as long as the prices go down and you have the storage, it would be a game changer, right? So my thinking has always been towards that and finding ways that you can have independent storage of energy. Yeah. Uh, and so lithium ion became very interesting. And then there's been a lot of research with hemp actually. With what? Um, with hemp. Okay. And hemp being a good storage mechanism. I'll send, I'll send you the guy who's doing a lot of research on it. I think you'll find it fascinating. But it stores energy much better than lithium ion and it's, you know, much cheaper and renewable. It's a battery. Uh, it's yeah. Hemp battery. battery. Yeah. 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 I'll send it to you. There's a guy who does experiments on YouTube with it. And, um, there's been some write-ups about it. What I've got to do is I got to make notes on the things I promised to send you. There's been, so I'll have to, let me just make sure that I write down the hemp battery stuff. Cause I really want to hear your opinion on this stuff because I come from an investor point of view and I've been doing pretty good with investing in Tesla and I feel like they're doing some game changing things. Mm -hmm. And then with the hemp batteries, I think that that would be a game changer if that could be commercialized. Now, what you're talking about is basically a utility scale storage system. The issue for Africa is that even if we have a utility scale storage system, well, the price is going to be so much better. It will be renewable. Um, and then that money that they save instead of buying oil, they could use for infrastructural distribution. Right. Yep. Um, so my, my thinking is, is that because what I did is I gave up on the utilities to solve Africa's energy problem that it would have to be, residential the power street. plants yeah. yeah residential power plants basically mm -hmm. um and tesla actually has this software i forget what it's called man but basically lets you do energy arbitrage It's very very mm -hmm. interesting um but i'm going to send you some of this information i want to hear your commentary on it but certainly for any of these places, it would help normalize the grid mm -hmm. in terms of what you have. Like, basically on the, the test that you're doing, like if everything goes well, when would it be ready for commercialization? Uh, my hope is three years. So, so our next step, so, so we're, we're trying to build a prototype of essentially a fully Full, a, a miniature version of what you saw in the figure. Right. Um, if that works, then I have some people interested in building a pilot. Mm. Make. Are you still being a professor if it works? <laughs> or are you going into business? Are you going into private industry? What are you going to do? Start I'm definitely company? going into business. Um, I'm not necessarily giving up the professor gig, which is which is one of the most valuable aspects of the gig. Um, it's actually encouraged for me to go start a company, despite the fact that what I have come up with or will come up with is owned by the schools, they will license it to me like because it's not of any usage to them. Like, so they'll pay to patent it and then they give it to me to go run with it. Like, it's really an ideal situation. Oh, okay. We skipped something. Yeah. Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And you went back to MIT. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's probably another our conversation oh wow <laughs> because, because people are going to be interested in the continuity because you're working on this yeah project of what you just showed us at mit uh it's straddled so i started on this at georgia tech the patents were filed while i was at georgia tech okay 
I was getting recruited to MIT in the midst of it all. We got some money to do it, like right, we were, I applied literally as I was, right after I was signed with MIT as I was writing the proposals to get this funded to do, to do it for the first time. Okay. So the money showed up right when I was like starting at MIT. Okay, so a brother turns down MIT after the PhD. Yeah. Because he wants to go to Chocolate City. Yep. Right? <laughs> you got to Chocolate City, right? Yep. And then you go to MIT. Yeah, yeah, that's a long story. Okay, uh, that's a long story, but yeah. something became more attractive about MIT. It's yeah. Up to yeah, it's complicated. Okay. I got divorced. That was that was that that played a huge role in it. Okay, so yep. that happens, but in terms of professionally, mm -hmm. you could choose Georgia Tech to keep your work going on, but did you feel like MIT was more advantageous for the work that you're doing? Yeah. In terms of funding and yeah, basically everything. <laughs> and quite honestly, it was a really big leap of faith because I didn't understand it well at the time that I was making the decision. I'm glad I made the choice I did because now I understand it very well. But they did actually a very, very poor job of selling me on MIT. A very mm -hmm. poor job. They, there are all kinds of things they could have explained to me that are huge perks to coming here that they didn't articulate at all. Um, Just, can you name a few? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the, the, one of my biggest tasks as a professor is to bring in the money to do the research. You know, I got to go fundraise. I got to go write proposals and get the government or whoever to give me money. Um, I remember writing this proposal for this technology. And, uh, you know, I got, you, you, you write the proposal, it gets submitted through an office called the Office of Sponsored Programs. At MIT, they sent back this like auto reply once you're trying to submit your proposal and says someone in office of sponsor programs is going to review your proposal. We'll get back to you. And then at the bottom of the email says, you know, fun fact, did you know that MIT proposals have a greater than 40% chance of being funded by all federal agencies and greater than 60% with all non-federal agencies? And when I saw that, I was like, oh, <laughs> The reason that's significant is because it's like 10% everywhere else. It's like a 4x higher hit rate mm -hmm. on proposals. A proposal is a very, very big undertaking when you write them. I and mean, these are like anywhere from 15 to 30 page miniature theses that you have to write in four weeks or less while you're doing everything else you have to do. They're very intensive, time intensive and, and, and work intensive. And, and, and it's a very, uh, you know, because the hit rate is so low, you have to write 10 proposals to get one funded. But at MIT, it's like every other proposal is getting funded. Hmm. It's a dramatic difference. The second thing is the visibility. And the reason for this is because MIT, because of its reputation, it has certain entrenched interests in those funding pools that have relationships and- It's the reputation alone. Reputation. <laughs> you know, um, people see that name and they, they, there's just a ton of credibility that comes with that name. You know, prior, I, I had this concept when I was at Georgia Tech, when I would talk about this concept, people would, the conversation was about, well, did you check this? Did you think about this? What about this? And, and as soon as my credential became, I'm a MIT professor, when I would give this, this talk, same talk, same technology, the conversation was dramatically different. It's who's funding this? I got somebody that's going to want to put some money in. Like it, it, nobody questions if You're I know what I'm talking more about. seriously. They don't even question if I know what I'm talking about anymore. I used to have to argue with people. Like I, I thought about that. I know what I'm talking about. Like, and, but at MIT, it's like, I get the benefit of the doubt. But you knew that though, right? You knew what? You, you knew that if you were doing something coming out of MIT that you would be taken more seriously I mean, I, sus I suspected there was some of that. Because of the name. I suspected some of it, but being me, me being in the field and, and like, like just because somebody's from MIT doesn't mean anything to me. Cause, cause to I'm, you, yeah, to you. So, I, so it's, okay. I know it means something to some people, but right. I didn't, there's a lot that happens here that people don't really talk about all that publicly. I'm seeing it now in the position I'm in now where I'm like, 
you know, there's like things people say, and it's kind of like a saying, but you don't really know if it's just like, it just sounds like, like a myth. <laughs> but they used to say, you know, rich people walk the halls of MIT, and they literally walk around, and if they see somebody that's doing something interesting, they just give you money. And so, like, it's not exactly like that, but it's kind of <laughs> like that. <laughs> like, no, like, no, uh, I know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people... I used to have to really go out and find all the money and now the money comes and finds me. Right. And so that's a dramatic difference, dramatic, dramatic difference. And so it was a good move. It was a good move. Um, but you're saying that before this experience that you didn't know that MIT and like Harvard and them places had like privilege where, I mean, I mean, when I was there, when I was in Boston, you know, the cats I went to school with, I mean, their fathers were senators, like I so mean, people were just like deeply entrenched into the power structure of this country, old money, like, you know, like they could make things happen. It, it, was, it was not clear to me what the difference would be relative to Georgia Tech. Georgia mm. Tech is a $5 billion operation. You know, it's big. They bring in a ton of money. It's very smart people. Mm -hmm. I was not convinced that like the people at MIT are like way smarter than anybody at Georgia right. Tech. Because I mean, Georgia Tech's number five. Georgia Tech's an awesome school. Right. No, it is. Yeah. You know? Um, so, but there's, but there's it, levels to this. <laughs> but that's the thing. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, and this was a heavy, heavy debate when I was weighing whether or not to do it. It's like you're at number five, which in the undergrad, we're number, Georgia Tech is number two. So it's like you're going to go from, number two to number one is it really that big a jump is it worth risking all this stuff right, it, right, you know right, what i mean right, it's like right. what's the big difference between five and one on grad school you know what i mean man i'm gonna tell you when it hit home for me i was at mit i'm 18 years old i go to mit for something there's some type of conference about something i end up going and i end up and i don't know i can't remember what building it is man but yo I went in that building and that hallway was like a mile long, man. Yeah, the infinite court. I don't know. I don't remember the name of the building, but I walked in that building yeah. and the hallway was like a mile long, yo. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's called the infinite quarter. It's a special one. It's, it's actually designed as a particular day on the, I think it's the equinox. The sun actually aligns and shines down the whole hallway. Like it's like the whole thing. <laughs> You know, there's levels to this. There's just yeah. levels to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a mile long hallway. Yeah, for I think for a long time it was the longest hallway in the world. They What's called it called the, again? What's it called again? It's called the Infinite Corridor. The Infinite Court? Corridor. Corridor. What's the name of the building? So that is what you you were walking through many MIT buildings. The MIT buildings are numbered. I mean, I'll pull up a map. I'll show you what you were. I'll show you where you were walking. I gotta, I gotta go in a minute because I gotta. Yeah, 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 yeah. I gotta teach in the morning. Yeah, so. we, we, this was a great conversation, man. Yeah, we we'll have to pick it back up. Yeah. So this is MIT campus. This is Mass Ave. Yeah. So you most likely walked in here to Building Seven. And you walk straight down this series of buildings. This is the long infinite corridor all the way down to there. Okay, that's probably where it was. Yeah. Yep, that's I'm sure that that's where it was. It's off of Mass Ave. Yep. Yep. So Man, this is the column here. Back. Yeah, this is the column. Yes, yeah, there's a column there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So straight all the way to the back. This is the long. So really, it's a series of buildings. So it's building seven. Okay. A little piece of building three, building 10, building four, building eight, all the way down that corridor. But it's all one contiguous corridor. Yeah. So can you imagine the 18 year old kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. And then and then you know that that corridor is like a showcase. You know, there's labs with open windows so you can see what's going on. And it's a it's a whole experience. Excellent, man. Um, look, you've given me a lot of your time. You've given the world a lot of your time because this is gonna be <laughs> no, this is gonna be on YouTube and this is gonna be there forever. Yeah. But I, one of the things I say about this age that we're in, the power of video and YouTube is, is that this is really kind of like the first generation 
mm-hmm. where our descendants a thousand years from now will be able to see what we were doing. Like, can you imagine if you could see what your great, 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 great grandparents a thousand years back were actually doing in real time? Mm-hmm. Like if that was videotaped, right. what if our ancestors who built the pyramids put that on YouTube, the process? Yeah. yeah. You know? Like, they'd, they'd be talking like all the stuff is matter of fact. You'd be like, yeah. Then you, then you say the secret word and the yeah. love yeah. it takes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, Whoa, you, you know what I'm saying? Out. Yeah. Like th- this is why I find it so important is because your descendants will be able to see yeah. your plans for what if what if what you build with this heat mm-hmm. storage system becomes the t- the transformative ener- energy storage right. model and they're able to see when their great 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 grandfather actually was working on this yeah like that's what i find the power in these types of things are like to be able to document greatness before people even know it's great yeah yeah they got to see it when it was a schematic on a computer (laughs) exactly yeah for real you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and then to hear your story Mm -hmm. to how it came about and Mm -hmm. the fact that you know were it not for that conversation that your mother had for you, you might not be where you're at right now, where you're able to maybe even change the world and literally stop global warming. Right. Like this is, this is all like more important than we even know Mm -hmm. and we realize, you know? So it is 1 a.m. We've been at this since nine. And this has been a great conversation. I hope that the people listening were inspired by this man and I'm going to keep doing this with all different types of people. So if you've got colleagues, you got other folks that you think are interesting, um, the conversation is going to be like this, where people can just relax and, you know, it doesn't have to be all work talk, but, you yeah. know, people can talk about what it is their interests are and what their muse was and got them to be what they're going to be. So feel free to send them my way. I'm going to be doing this wherever I am in the world. Um, I've been fortunate to meet all types of just, very interesting people and something just told me that you were the first person I wanted to have on this show because mm-hmm. part of the reason that we don't know each other but we know of each other and I've been following your work and uh, we have mutual friends and I respect what you're doing to the highest degree and even I, I feel you. like I feel like part of my life was sidetracked and probably I should have gone more into the science I mean I have a science degree but I didn't go get a PhD and I didn't take it as seriously. Um, I ended up becoming a lawyer. So, um, you know, I still read scientific journals. I'm still into that. And so, you know, keeping tabs on what you're doing is an inspiration to me in terms of what if, you know, I had, you know, gone that path. And so it's almost nice to kind of see what you're doing, man. And also seeing that you're doing it with a purpose. You know, not just for um, humanity, but to also be an inspiration for our people, for anyone who would ever want to walk in your footsteps, man. So just thank you for being so giving. Yeah, I appreciate with your, your, with your uh, life, man. Appreciate you reaching out and, and putting this together, man. It sounds like a, a excellent thing and uh, appreciate being being invited to do this. It's, uh, it's, it's helpful to try to share as much as I can. You know what I mean? So thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot, bro. And It'll be up in a couple of days and I'll let you know and feel free to share it with your peoples. All right. Oh, we'll do, man. Appreciate it. All right, it. man. Have a good evening. All right. Take care. All right. Peace. Peace.